Hello, son and daughter. Welcome to Old Texas Scare Podcast. Back when I was younger, I did some survey work for a logging company in Alaska, as I was fit and liked to hike. They sent me in first to check out the terrain and figure out the best ways into the area they wanted to harvest. I always traveled light, just a backpack with a United States Army mess kit, some MRS, a few spare clothes, a fire kit, a bivouac, sack, and axe, a knife some bear spray and my late granddad's revolver. I also used to cut me a nice thick hiking stick. With all that gear packed, I set out on foot. The first night was largely very quiet, and I got a good night's sleep. Only one time I woke up to what I thought was the wind rustling through the trees, and I didn't think much of it. The next day, I arrived at the designated logging area and started to do my work. Around noon, I started to get that eerie feeling of being watched. I had had this feeling before, but I always blamed my imagination for it. Well, it grew more and more over the day. Right when I was about to set up camp for the night, I heard some rustling in the brush again and caught a glimpse of something big huddling out of sight. Needless to say, I skipped setting up the camp and booked it out of there. I walked about ten miles until I was too tired to move on. The feeling of being watched had stopped, and I deemed it safe to set up my camp. I woke up in the morning, and the first thing I saw were bear tracks of what I think was a huge grizzly going all over my campsite. I have never broke up the camp this fast again. I made sure my revolver was loaded and within arm's reach at all times and kept my bear spray at the ready on the way back, but nothing happened anymore. I told the logging company about my encounter, and they said they will take the necessary precautions. A few months later, when the logging operation was in full swing, a worker was attacked by what was later described as a huge male grizzly bear. A year or so later, hunters in that area shot one of the biggest grizzlies I have ever seen, and judging by the size of its paws, it could have been that very bear stalking me on that hike. was driving through Alaska trying to get to Haines to take the ferry to Washington. Stopped at this small town bar to ask for directions to a place to spend the night. Everyone in the bar turned and looked at me like I was an alien from outer space. The older lady offered to give me lodging for free for a price. Wink wink. I was a fit soldier that just left the military so I guess I was extremely attractive at the time. I knew from the safety briefings that STDs were prevalent in the area, so I said, uh, that's fine, I'll find some place down the road. You're good, thanks. Anyway, I found this abandoned quarry and set up my tent next to this vehicle that had bullet holes all over it, shotgun to hell. When I settled down into the sleeping bag, I heard these footsteps from above the half crater I was in. I took out my knife and placed it over my neck under the sleeping bag and tried to go to sleep, but my hypervigilance was activated too far, and there was no way to see outside the tent. I had too much stuff in the car people would want, so I packed up the tent and drove down the road. I slept on the turnoff in the car overnight and woke up to a nice sunrise over the mountain range. Myself and a few others were camped at a spot called Ray Lakes in California. We, being reasonable persons, do not hike at night, but we were sat by our campfire watching a night hiker's headlamp come steadily down and down and down along switchbacks which awaited us the next day. Our concerns were, why the F would a person with a tent on their back willingly hike at night, and that we had caught six fish when the limit was five. Once the stranger reached our camp, it turned out he ran with a crew that saw the Sierra Club, his right wing. He was interested in killing all the trout in the high Sierra Lake so that a natural stasis of loud-ass frogs and mosquitoes, of which there are entirely too many in my opinion, could regain dominance over the land.
This March, I went hiking or camping with some friends, and there was one guy who's never been before. We decided to set up camp once the sun had gone down and we got tired. New guy comments on how it's weird that there's so much dew on the ground when it hasn't rained. When our headlamps hit the ground, sure enough, there's millions of tiny glowing dots of reflection covering almost every inch of the ground, like morning dew. I point out the daw is glowing red and tell him to look closer. He learned three things that night. He learned why we use camp hammocks instead of traditional tents. He learned that wolf spider eyes glow red when hit with bright light, and most importantly, he learned that he doesn't like being in the woods at night. When I was 15 or 16, I lived in a very rural area. I'm talking wooded areas right in my backyard, complete with all the flora and fauna that goes with them. I loved to go out back and walk the paths in the forest right after the sun went down, but right before it got too dark. I would always take large sticks with me, hinking sticks, as the wildlife there could be dangerous. I would also take my dog sometimes. I lived in a place with a few neighbors who had a lot of land, mostly so their wildlife could graze, so besides the few times my neighbors went out to get cattle or other stuff, we were pretty much left alone. That day I had my dog and one of my favorite sticks with me. Yes, I had favorite hiking sticks. Don't judge. It was getting late, but I didn't want to go inside despite the rapidly darkening sky. I decided I would take the long way out of the forest, so I steered my dog onto a trail that I only took when I wanted to go right by the river. It went by the bank and then straight into a thick set of brush, a thicket where deer loved to ritz and graze. I wasn't afraid of deer. They usually left us alone and seemed to dislike my dog, so I didn't think anything was off when I felt like I was being watched, just animals being animals. But as I advanced into the thicket, my dog began to growl low in her throat, and I began to freak out. I have panic attacks a lot, especially in very tense situations. Now, with growing fear and the feeling that some hand was off, I urged my dog to run. She did. I went straight after her, running faster than I ever have before. I don't exactly remember what happened, but I remember that I tripped and fell close to the edge of the thicket. I looked up and saw something I will never forget. In the shadows of the thicket, something was staring at me with bright yellow eyes. It looked like the shadow of a man, but I don't know what it was. It seemed a bit off. I can't recall its exact features, but when I saw it, a feeling of terror so horrible and intense engulfed me. A feeling that gave me two options. Run or cower. There was not fight. I knew I could not win. I was going to cower. I was not going to move. But my dog had other plans. She dragged me, dragged me right out of that thicket. And onto my feet I've never ran so fast in my life. It was a primal instinct, one I could not obey. I didn't go into the forest for a month after that. Even then, I was never fully comfortable. I never told anyone about my encounter. Only a few close friends who scoff at me. But I swear, that night I saw something. I don't know what, but I do know that I saw it. And although I have had few nightmares featuring it, I believe it is the most terrifying experience I have ever had. Something's out here with us. Last weekend, one of my friends brought up the idea of camping. At first, I was opposed to it as it's fall and cold outside, and the idea of having to sleep in a tent with another person just didn't seem appealing. But when all five of us talked about it, I realized that maybe it wasn't such a bad idea after all. We decided to do it next weekend. Okay, now. This morning, we went out and bought everything we needed. Tents, snakes, a lighter, and a couple of more things that don't need mentioning. We decided it would be best to do it in the woods two hours away from any road or houses, 
I was particularly upset about that, as anything could happen from some random person attacking us to a bear sneaking in our tents. But we'd have our car parked on the nearest road, so if anything did happen, we could just run to it. At least that's what some others said. I brought up the fact it's a two-hour walk, but of course I was ignored. We drove as far as we could before we got out to start walking. I noticed a few things. First of all, no sound of wildlife. No crickets, no birds. No, nothing making sound. And it felt odd, like something was slightly off. I chalked it up to my nerves acting up and ignored it. Where should we set the rents up at? Rob asked, taking a puff of his joint. Right over there. Looks good, Nate replied, motioning for Rob to pass it to him. Who's setting it up? After a little conversation, we decided Dan and Murphy could do it while the rest of us goes out to see if we can find any squirrels to hunt. I doubted it. It didn't exactly seem like this place was crawling with wildlife. Grab my riffle, would ya? I grabbed it and threw it at him. Don't worry, it wasn't loaded yet. He catches it, saying a quick thanks, and off we went. We were out for hours looking to no avail. There was absolutely nothing. I didn't even see any bugs. Maybe we should go on back now. We can eat the stuff we brought. I suggested. Rob and Nate stopped walking, to which I assumed meant they agreed. We turned back around and started walking back towards camp. A couple of minutes of walking, I heard a sound. It was quiet, but we all heard it. We stopped walking to look around. Behind us, there was a deer. Except... It wasn't normal. Its horns were growing out of its mouth, and it had five legs. I had never seen anything like it before, but I've heard of it. Deformed deers, I wasn't too worried. We decided not to kill it because we definitely weren't about to eat it, being too worried about catching some type of disease. I wondered, though, how long has that deer been following us, being so silent that we hadn't even noticed it. We made it back to camp about an hour later. We ended up eating some cans of chili we brought with us. We cooked it over the fire we made. The five of us were sharing tents, two in one and three in another. I was sharing with Nate. Robert, Murphy, and Dan were in the other. We stayed up for a few more hours singing songs and drinking beer before we headed off to bed. I fell asleep about an hour after laying down. Click, 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 click. I woke up to a clicking noise. It took me a second to register what was happening. I assumed it was one of the guys doing something, but just in case I grabbed my gun and unzipped the tent. I froze. The deer from before was standing outside my tent, its mouth moving weirdly. Its teeth were clicking against each other every few seconds from the weird movement. It followed us all the way back. How did we not notice? I zipped the tent back and tried to ignore it. Needless to say, I got no sleep that night. The next morning, all six of us decided to stay one more thing before packing up to leave. It was weird. I felt like something was messing with my mind, that my brain wasn't working correctly. I was scared I just didn't know what of. Me, Dan, Nate, Robert, Murphy, and wait, and what was I talking about? There was only five no six of us. Wait six. Never mind, it's not important. I spend all evening wondering what was wrong with my mind. I could tell the others felt the same way. That night all six of us went to sleep, three in one and three in another. I was with Nate and someone, something felt wrong, but I just couldn't put my foot on it. That night I woke up to the same clicking noise as last night, this time from inside the tent. I was too scared to move had the deer somehow made it into the tent. However, I felt Nate shift to get up. What? I heard him say before he went silent, cutting off whatever he was about to say. What the hell? I heard him say again, slightly louder this time. I felt something move on my left side, which was strange because Nate was on my right side. Oh, oh shit, I heard before I felt someone leap over me onto Nate. I woke up the next morning panting. Was it all a dream? I wondered. All five of us packed up to leave. Something still felt wrong. No. One of us felt wrong. Nate was off. He talked the same and acted the same, but it was the way he looked. Have you ever heard of Uncanny Valley? 
Like that, I know something was off, but I just couldn't put my finger on it. I ignored it, and with that, all five of us walked to the car, got in and took off. I couldn't help but feel like I made a mistake, like I was about to unleash something unholy into the town we live in, like I did something bad. In August 1993, I was a deputy sheriff in Pierce County, Washington. I was a part of a search for a missing hiker. We had split up into single searchers early into the investigation. I was assigned to an area near Evans Creek Preserve. This area was state land, but adjacent to federal land. It was approximately 2.15 p.m. and the weather was overcast. The woods can become very dark in this area, though I was familiar with the general location. As I conducted my search for the missing hiker, I encountered an unknown entity that was staring at me. It was several hundred feet away, but I could make out that it was human, shaped, but very large and tall. I cautiously approached the individual. As I got closer, it was obvious that this man was nude and that he was of tremendous size. I was within 50 yards or so when he bolted to my right into the deep dark woods at a speed that was completely impossible for a human being to achieve. I yelled for him, or it, to stop, but he continued to run away. My instincts told me that this giant may somehow be involved in the disappearance of the hiker. By this time I had drawn my weapon. I was hesitant to call for help or to report what I had witnessed. I was even questioning myself as to what this could have been. Was I hallucinating this giant being? I tried to follow the giant man, but it was simply impossible to do so. After 15 minutes or so, I was getting spooked and decided to find my way back to the trail and continue with the search for the hiker. I'll admit, I was fearful of being ambushed by the giant man. The giant man was at least 12 feet in height very muscular in build, olive skin with no visible hair. He was completely nude. I didn't get close enough to describe facial features, but the head was enormous and oval shaped. He never made any sounds. It just seems impossible that anything of that size really exists. The hiker was eventually found nearer to Mitt, Rainier, which was east of my location. I remained with the department for another three years until I moved to Oregon and started working for a security firm. After my encounter with a giant, I was much more wary of the outdoors. I still questioned what I witnessed that day, but I never told anyone other than my wife and a close friend about the incident. I'm not sure if they believe me. I have never heard of any related sightings here in the Pacific Northwest. This is why I contacted you. Have you ever heard or read of a similar sighting or encounter? Do the giants really exist? Thanks for your time. I grew up in western New York near Rochester, not too far from the Canadian border. My dad built a mini mansion that backed up to the forever wild woods. That's the New York State program that keeps the wilderness as is. Once the house was built, the woods became the playhouse for myself and my closest friend, DJ. It is the early 1990s and we love being outside. One day while exploring, we found an amazing section about 50 minutes walk into the woods that was a gorgeous swamp full of flowers and light. I remember approaching it. There were snapped trees all around and straight branches jammed into the ground like spikes. The solid land went into the swamp like a peninsula. The trees were almost like walls on each side that funneled us out onto it. We approached the water and saw snapping turtles quickly submerged. Being kids, we started skipping rocks and throwing boulders to get splashes, just doing what kids do. Then out of nowhere, DJ and I felt a wave of fear, sort of a sixth sense. Our hair stood up. We were both looking around for what triggered this primal feeling. DJ pointed to a tree across the water, and I can only describe it as if the top half was bending back and forth, not like the wind was gently pushing it, but like it was close to snapping, left then right, back and forth. 
It was bending, creaking loud over and over, quicker and quicker. The bottom of the tree barely moved. Then out of nowhere there was this rumbling growl that was so loud it shook our insides. I've been around loud things before and even learned to shoot an 8-gauge black powder shotgun. No sound compared to the force of this. Picture your soul getting pushed out your back and then springing back inside like a giant invisible rubber band. In the pierced silence of this, we both ran for our effing lives. The whole way home we ran through bushes and branches ripping up our exposed skin. We both thought we could hear pursuit all around us but said nothing. Once home, we tried sharing what happened with my parents, but they wouldn't listen. We decided to stay inside for the rest of the day. As usual, DJ was spending the night, and we decided to crash in the support, a 25 by 25 foot room filled with double hung windows on two exterior walls, a sliding glass door that led to a three-story deck, and a, a French door that led to a formal living room. Dad had worked hard. He went from a garbage man to a business owner, so this house was massive. Anyway, DJ was on the couch while I lay on the floor in front of the TV with a Nintendo. It was summer, so all the double-hung windows were opened wide. I stretched out with my arms behind my head, my neck on a couple of pillows, and my fingers were interlaced. My hands were sort of folding up the back of my head with elbows flared out. DJ was out and snoring, and... I was half asleep watching something on the TV. As God is my is my witness. Out of nowhere, I felt a massive hand engulf both my hands and part of my wrist and pull me toward the windows. I moved a good two, three feet, and effing lost it, screaming in terror. It released me, and within a minute, my dad ran in. DJ was silent and just staring at me. I told my dad what happened. So he went to each window and said the screens were all slid down and in place. He said that it was just a dream for me to man up and shut up. I shut up and prayed he'd just go back out. I looked at DJ and asked him if he had seen it. He just looked at me and didn't say anything about it. He ended up calling his parents and getting picked up in the middle of the night. I went upstairs and tried to sleep in my room. The next day, I called DJ's house to see if he wanted to come over, and his mom said he didn't feel good and to not call again until I heard from him. This confused my 12-year-old mind. We never got together again after that. I'd see him occasionally. He was cold with me every time. Eventually, at the end of summer, I ran into him on the canal path, one of our fishing spots, and decided to question him. His mom wasn't there to be the buffer. He finally confessed that on that night, for some reason, he awoke and saw a predator grab and pull me. He didn't use that specific word. Instead, he described a massive, clear, but distorted shimmer thing that reached in and grabbed me. I never knew others had seen this cloak of invisibility. I now refer to it as a predator. Did it lift the screen up slide easily enough and then close it that quick? Did it somehow pass through the fiberglass mesh? I just don't know. I looked in the morning but saw no tracks, and DJ thought it was a ghost. I didn't put it all together until much later as an adult. I think it followed me home after we trespassed on its turf. It could have hurt us easily at any time, but it didn't. I almost think it had a sick type of humor and enjoyed terrifying us a little bit. I never went that far back in the woods after that. In September 2020, I had a chilling encounter that still haunts my memory to this day. I was on my way to work, driving along United State 10 near Reed City, Michigan. It was a typical morning, and I was lost in thought, sipping my coffee and listening to the radio. Little did I know that this ordinary commute would lead to a brush with the extraordinary. As I cruised down the highway, something caught my eye in the rearview mirror. At first, I thought it was a trick of the light, but when I glanced back again, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. A massive, seven-foot-tall creature, weighing at least 375 pounds, sprinted across the road behind me. It moved with an uncanny speed and agility for its size. My heart 
pounded in my chest as I strained to catch another glimpse of the creature. It was covered in dark matted fur, and its form was unlike anything I had ever seen. This was no bear or any known animal that should be roaming the woods of Michigan. I watched in disbelief as it vanished into the dense forest on the other side of the road. I was left in a state of shock, my mind racing to comprehend what I had just witnessed. I had always been a skeptical person when it came to tales of cryptids and creatures of the unknown, but this encounter had shaken me to my core. I never saw it, but in 1975 I was newly married about 21 years old and had a small baby. My sister, who was a teenager, was visiting us. My husband, my sister, and I had all gone to our bedrooms to settle down and go to sleep. I would say it was around 11 or 12 at night. We were just starting to relax and get sleepy, when out of nowhere there was this horrible loud howl or yell. I mean, it was so loud it made my chest vibrate and my ears hurt. The sound was not human, but had a guttural human-like sound mixed with what sounded like a wolf. We were living in a mobile home at the time, and it howled just outside our back door, in the hallway near our bedroom. We jumped out of bed, looked at each other, and both said at the same time, What the hell was that? My husband was ten years older than I was and was an avid hunter. He wasn't the kind of guy to scare easily. His face drained of color. My sister came running down the hallway, white as a ghost, and said, what was that? I told her I didn't know. My husband said he was getting his rifle and grabbed it out of the closet. He opened up the back door and yelled out into the wind. You better get the S out of here or I will blow your head off. He listened a moment before I yelled at him to please shut the door. He did and we never heard any more after that. Needless to say, we stayed up all night afraid to go to sleep. I have never forgotten that how. There is no way it was a dog or coyotes. I have heard both how. It wasn't a guy joking around either. It was so loud, there is no way a human could have made that sound. I love your show and am glad to hear. I am not the only one who has heard something like this. I am in summer camp and something is throwing people off trees. A little introduction before we begin. My friends and I have been going to summer camp every year. Tom, Jack, Susan, and Emily are my friends who have been accompanying me since forever. We're high school students. This time we chose a different camp. It was called Camp Jacob, and it's on a small island called Jacob's Isle. We travel to Jacob's Isle on a ferry. It is about three and a half hour journey from the mainland, and the first thing we noticed was that there is no cell reception here. David is the leader of the summer camp, and he has a satellite phone for communication with the ferry and mainland. We hiked till the camp. It was a half hour hike. We saw the establishment was amazing. There were two dozen small huts made of wood. The main building was no different. The main building was in the middle of the camp, and it comprised of a common room, kitchen, dining room, a storage room, and an infirmary. Twelve huts, each on either side of the main building. Each hut had two bunk beds and can fit four people. Tom, Jack, and I got in hut seven, along with fellow camper Ashwin. Emily and Susan went to hut twenty. One, all four corner huts. One, twelve, thirteen, twenty-four were occupied by them. We were to unpack and meet the others in thirty minutes, where we shall make a bonfire for the evening. It was a fun experience. We have made friends with Ashwin, and we also met the girls sharing the hut with Susan and Emily. They were Lily and Rose. Lily and Rose were cousins. We had dinner and were told that we would go to the sunrise point in the morning, and so we have to wake up by 4.30 a.m., as the sunrise is at 5.45 a.m. It is a half-hour hike, and it wasn't easy to get up so early. We started the hike at 5 a.m. and were told it was about 10 minutes away, but in reality it took twice the time. We were on the east coast of the island. It was a beach of white sand. This was my new favorite place. 
Jack had his camera out to capture the moment when the sun rises. It was a beautiful sight and worth waking up early. We hiked back to the camp through the forest when we heard a growling sound. It was scary. The counselors huddled us and escorted us back to the camp. I could see that they were nervous. We were told to go to the main building for breakfast. I saw David and three others went scouting north of the camp. The other counselors were smiling, but they were tense. What do you think that scent was? I asked. It was scary. I don't care what it was, and I don't want to know, Susan replied. Only that it should stay away from us, Emily said. Come on, Peter. Don't scare the girls, Tom laughed. Yeah, it can be a bird or something. The forest can make it sound scarier, Ashwin said with conviction. I disagree. Something scary is out there. Check this out. Jack gestured us to take a look at his camera. The small lead screen wasn't so easy to look at, but Emily saw what Jack wanted to show. It took a lot of pointing and zooming before I could see the red dots behind the trees. Jack thought they were eyes. I thought they were lens flares or something. This is not a scary movie, all right. It must be some lens flare thingy, I said, but deep down I was scared too. Susan queried, Guys, where is Lily and Rose? Must be somewhere here, Ashwin said. I haven't seen them after we came back to camp, Dom responded in a worried manner. Come, Susan, let's check the hut out. Emily grabbed on Susan's hand, and they went to find Lily and Rose. No sooner did they leave the common room did we hear the same growling sound, followed by loud shrieks. We ran outside to see Emily fainted and Susan holding her. Then I saw the lifeless body of Rose. Blood splattered everywhere, as if she has jumped from a tall building. Another bone-chilling growl, and then I froze. I saw Lily flying. Something had thrown her from a tree, and she came crashing down just beside Rose. I couldn't scream. This was something which I had never expected to witness. This couldn't be a dream, as I don't have the imagination to imagine something as gruesome as this. The counselors came running out and asked us to check if anyone else is missing. It was a huge mess. Everyone was shouting. It took some time for us to settle down. We were scared to death. The bodies were moved to the infirmary in the main building. Everyone else was accounted for. David and the three others who left with him returned, and they called the mainland for the ferry. The camp was obviously canceled. The growling continued. We were told to pack up our stuff, and we would leave after three hours. It wasn't easy to wait for three long hours. We have to hike south to go to the dock. They should send the army to kill this thing, Emily said, still shaking. The growling continued. Maybe this thing has given birth or something and feel threatened when we came here, Susan said. Stop trying to justify murder, I shouted. I know she was just trying to help, trying to make sense of it all, but I was scared shitless. I am sorry. I am just scared. I apologize. Susan put her hand on mine. It's okay. I understand. We were all called outside and David announced, given the circumstances. We will not hike to the dock. We will wait here for help to arrive. The sheriff's department along with the forest rangers will be arriving soon and they will escort us out of here. Till then, stay quiet. Please, don't wander off anywhere. If you have to go back to the hut, then inform a counselor. Don't go out alone. This was good news. After a few tense hours, we were escorted out to the ferry and returned home. On the way back, we were told it was a bear, which must have done it. But it was a bizarre scenario. No one has ever heard anything like this before. I don't buy it one bit. Something is definitely wrong in that island. I have promised myself no more summer camps. But I still have nightmares, and I feel that I am back at the camp. It is nighttime, and something is throwing me down from the top of a tree. I'll never forget that fateful day in Illinois six years ago, the day I stood at the grave of my beloved wife, Lulu. Her passing had been sudden, a cruel twist of fate that had ripped her from my life.
It was a pain I thought I would never recover from, and I was there at the funeral watching in disbelief as the casket was lowered into the cold earth. The sound of dirt hitting the coffin lid haunted me for years. Life had other plans for me, and I soon found myself in Kansas trying to leave behind the memories of Lulu. I had been living there for three years, merely going through the motions of existence. There was nothing extraordinary about this part of my story. Such things happen every day. But then came the strange part, the inexplicable events that have left me puzzled and restless. It all started when I received a letter from my old home in Illinois, postmarked and signed with Lulu's name, unmistakably in her handwriting. I was certain of it because I compared it with letters she had written me before our marriage, letters I had kept as precious mementos. In that letter, Lulu claimed to be lonely and missing me terribly, urging me to return to her. But it contained a sentence that sent shivers down my spine. You all thought I died, but I did not, and am much better than when I saw you last. I couldn't fathom what that meant. How could someone who had been buried come back to life? Initially, I believed it to be a sick joke, perhaps the work of some friends back in Illinois. However, as more letters arrived, my unease grew. These letters, filled with affection and longing, provided no answers, only more questions. One particularly unnerving letter reached me from Concordia, Kansas, near where I used to live before coming to Nebraska. The writer lamented the fact that I had left before she could reach me, and the handwriting remained identical to Lulu's. This couldn't be a prank. It was something more sinister and inexplicable. My anxiety grew, and I sent some of the letters back to Lulu's parents, who confirmed the handwriting as their daughters but were as mystified as I was frustration gnawed at me, pushing me to address one of the letters to Mrs. W.W.S. Amoson. That letter, too, came back, returned from the dead. Letter office. The last letter, received about three weeks ago, was dated from Table Rock, Nebraska, and stated that Lulu was there, sick and in dire need of help. I rushed to Table Rock, determined to get to the bottom of this bizarre mystery. Upon my arrival, I learned that a woman matching Lulu's description had been staying at a local hotel. She was sick, rarely leaving her room, and departed suddenly without revealing her destination. The hotel register had an entry under the name Mrs. Lulu Amoson, with no address provided. It was the same handwriting, and the woman's description closely matched that of my dear Lulu from the last time I had seen her. Frustration and confusion gave way to a resolute determination. I decided to return to Illinois and had Lulu's remains exhumed, only to find her, as she had been buried years ago. There was no mistaking that fact. Now I stand at the crossroads of this inexplicable enigma, and my curiosity and apprehension gnaw at me. Who had been sending those letters, and who was the woman who had been using Lulu's name? I am not a superstitious man, but this bewildering mystery has shaken me to my core. My reputation remains untarnished, and my employer vouches for my character. Should I receive any more letters, I am resolved not to let them torment me, but to uncover the truth behind this eerie riddle. And when I do, I have promised to share my findings with the world. I'm writing today because I just read the story from a lady who is claiming the Mothman lived in her backyard. I don't completely disbelieve her claims as I'm in no position to do so. That's up to you and your investigators. I do know we have lots of underground creatures and many unexplained things in the woods. I wanted to tell you about an experience I had when I still lived back home in Wayne, West Virginia. It was around 2003. It was fall, I think. Being that I grew up in the W.O.B. Mountains, I've always been aware of the stories of the Mothman, creatures similar to the Mothman and what my great-grandmother called panthers. I don't know what these panthers really were, but she had a ton of stories about her father having to outsmart them and keep them away while traveling through the woods to get to town. I know she wasn't describing a mountain lion or bobcat, 
We all know what those are, and as far as I know, those hills aren't roaming grounds for mountain lions. They always said these creatures were vicious. They'd snatch who and whatever they could. However, they were afraid of fire. So it's fall. My ex-husband and I had been at my aunt's house for a birthday party. She lives on a country road with the mountains behind the house. For miles, there's nothing but woods back there. We were the first to leave. It was around dusk, and I was following my ex-husband out to the car while carrying my two-year-old son. Right before we reached the car, we were stopped dead in our tracks by the creepiest sound I have ever heard. It was so loud, echoing off the hills. It sounded very similar to a woman screaming bloody murder, just like the stories my great-grandmother told, but was definitely not a woman. It was one of those sounds that just feels ominous and sends those cold chills down your spine. I looked at my ex-husband and could tell it frightened him. That's what scared me more than anything. He was an avid woodsman and hunter. He knew the woods, could happily live in a tent in the woods, and wasn't afraid of much in life in general. I started searching the tree line with my eyes, just trying to see if I could see it. I could feel it staring right down at us. Yet we were both kind of frozen in shock. Then he gave me a look and told me to get my son and my, myself in the car immediately. I did, but thought we probably should have told everyone in the house to be careful when they went to leave. That was the only time in the 25 years I lived in. Yeah, that I heard that sound. Though, I continued to hear stories over the years. I don't know what that thing really is, and I don't want to find out personally. I also had a neighbor in 2006 that told me some pretty scary stuff. She said she was living in a house on Buffalo Creek Road in Wayne County, WVW. This is a back road, woods and mountains on both sides. My family owned quite a bit of land out there. There were mounds up on the mountains where the Native Americans buried their dead. She said there was an old cabin a little ways behind and to the right of the house. She was there alone. It was dark and getting late, so she decided to go to bed. She said as soon as she turned the lights off, she started hearing lots of racket coming from the cabin. Like pots and pans clanging together, glass breaking, etc., she thought it was a group of rowdy teens messing around in there, so she went out on the porch and yelled to tell them to hit the road. The noise stopped, but she didn't see any kids. She went back in to grab a flashlight and went closer to the cabin to investigate. She could see something dark move past the windows. She shined the light in, and it apparently looked right out the window at her. She booked it back to the house and locked herself in. She described it as Mothman-like but she didn't think for sure. That's what it was. She said it was pure evil. You could feel it. She said it was taller than her, all dark in color. Red eyes walked upright. I believed her. She wasn't one to make things up, and she was clearly frightened to tell the story. To make matters worse, that wasn't the last encounter that she had with the creature. There was another night when she was babysitting her nieces and nephews. She said it came up on the porch and started pacing back and forth. You could hear the boards creak with every step. They locked everything up and all ran into her bedroom and locked themselves in. They all were huddled together on the bed when it came around to the window. I guess it rapped on the window and scratched at it. They literally all hid under the covers. I guess they were all screaming and freaking out. She said it eventually went back to the front porch and was there until close to dawn. It wasn't long after that they moved. Now, I will say that I loved being in those woods on Buffalo Creek during the day. We always had fun. We'd find arrowheads and all kinds of different treasures the Indians left behind. At night, however, we wanted to be inside. I hated the back room, closest to the woods. My great-grandfather built several houses on that road. My family still lives there. It just always felt like there was something out there at night. The natural noises would get quiet all of a sudden. It just always seemed scary at night. Even as an adult, I would run from the car to the house. 
I don't know what's out there, but I'd say there are too many stories and witnesses to discount it. The strange incident took place near Powelton, West Virginia in December 1934. I was eight years old. At the time, my father worked for Elkhorn, Piney Cole, and McDunn. He and the other miners would take a train to the mine each day. The day before Christmas Eve, my father mentioned an unusual sighting he and the others on the train had while traveling back to Powelton from the mine that evening. As they looked out towards the east, they noticed a very large bird flying above the trees. My father was a very simple man and didn't believe in any nonsense, but this large bird really caught his attention. He described it as a freakish-sized owl, very dark in color. The sky was getting dark, but they could still make out the large form. He said it also looked at the train as it flew over the trees. Nobody on the train could figure out what it was. The mere fact that my father even mentioned it suggested that it must have been an unusual sight. My father was scheduled off from work for three days during the Christmas holiday. On December 27th, he was getting ready for work, but said he felt poorly. My mother was concerned because he had a high fever and awful chills. She insisted he stay home and telephone the doctor. My father was reluctant to stay home and put up a good argument, but my mother was not going to back down. She put him to bed and waited for the doctor. Well, we waited for hours until the telephone rang. The operator told my mother that the doctor was at McDunn. There had been a horrible train explosion. She couldn't talk, but said that the doctor's wife asked her to contact us. My mother was pale when she told my father what had happened. I remember they both started praying and crying. For years, both of them thought the large bird was an angel sent by God as a warning, and that my father's life was saved for a reason. My father never went back to the mine. It turned out that he had contracted polio, though he was very lucky since he survived it with only a slight limp. We soon moved away to a small town in Kentucky where my father found the calling and became a Pentecostal preacher. He told his story of survival to anyone who would listen until the day he died. I happened to read your stories while looking on the internet with my great-grandson. I always assumed my father saw something more divine. That's what he always believed. I'm not so sure now. Back in July of this year, I ordered eight towels from Amazon, and I remember receiving the box, and I have a vivid memory of rolling each towel up and putting them away. And I also remember this was a few days before we went on vacation, because I remember being excited that our house or dog sitter would have fresh towels. I return a week later from vacation and can't find the towels anywhere. I thought maybe our sitter took them for some odd reason, but never asked thinking it would come off rude and or weird. I looked everywhere and no towels. How do you misplace eight towels? So as time went on, I forgot about it. But then four months later, I get a notification from Amazon saying I'm getting a refund and it's for the towels. I clicked on it, thinking this is crazy and low, and behold, I got a refund for eight towels because the box was returned to them, and for some reason, the box was unable to be delivered. I don't know what happened, glitch in the matrix, but I am 100% sure. I got those two elves, and then they disappeared. T.S. I always check my Amazon order page, and there was never any issues about the towels not being delivered. Okay, so one night my husband came into our bedroom where I was already sleeping. When he opened the door, our room was dark, but he was able to see an even darker mist floating either right next to me or over me. He said it rushed by him, out the door, and dissipated. That's happened three times now. We have a lot of paranormal activity wherever we live. It doesn't really matter where. Nothing right now feels negative in any way. Mostly just bored, I think. Anyway, has anyone had any experience with a black mist hovering around them while they sleep or could just know what it is? 
I would like to add that I've been calling my spirit guides. Odd it been when this was happening, so it could be that. I don't have a clue and would greatly appreciate any insight. Thanks in advance. When I was young, my father used to like throwing parties almost every weekend and not just get together. I'm talking hiring a band and inviting friends and family and have them invite friends and family. So I would often see new faces come and go. But there was this one particular time when I was 11 and a girl around 8 years old and her older sister, who was also around 11, came in our house. I was an introverted kid and still am so while everyone was outside socializing. I was inside watching Spongebob like a true scholar would. Well, for some reason these sisters also didn't want to be outside and came inside and that's when I saw that the little sister didn't have any arms from the elbow down. So the little sister sat on one of the kitchen seats. Our kitchen and living room are connected so it's like one giant room and the older sister was humoring our Chihuahua we had at the time, and Will me, being the little introvert that I was their presence, killed my vibe. I got up to go to the kitchen and get a snack so I can head to my room. I get my snack and I make my way to my room, and before I pass the little sister on the kitchen seat, I see her move her stump towards the plate placemat we had at the time, and she motion her stump upwards, and placemat goes right into the air and she looks under the placemat. I stop dead in my tracks and just stare at her with awe and confusion cause my 11 year old brain cannot comprehend what the hell is happening before my eyes. Doing this caught the attention of her older sister cause she stopped playing with my dog, looked at her sister and rushed towards her, telling her to put it down and that she knows she shouldn't be doing this around people. She then looks at me and we just make eye contact for a solid three seconds. And that's when my cousin opens the front door and tells me the him, my other cousin, and my brother are going across the street to this knick-knack store to buy something and wanted to see if I wanted to tag along, which I did not hesitate in accepting. I told everyone what I just saw, but no one believed me. When we returned, more people had gotten inside and they were now surrounded by other girls. But I kept an eye on that sister the whole party to see if she would do it again. But nothing ever happened after that. So I wanted to ask if someone else has had a similar experience to this. So my mom is the property manager of a local trailer park. The maintenance man and his assistant were doing a scope of the park at around 1, 30 a.m., when they saw a strange thing on the roof of the trailer. Originally, they thought it was a mountain lion until it stood on two legs. The creature was paper white, his arms hung below his knees, and it was able to jump from trailer top to trailer top. But the weirdest thing it was doing was calling the name of the tenants inside of the trailers. They continued following it until it jumped over a tall fence and was off in the night. My mom would have thought they were just messing with her if it wasn't for the fact that four tenants called my mom the next morning to report something jumping on their roof. I've considered it being the rake or a flesh pedestrian, but there are problems with it being either one of those. Please help. It was about three years ago, in November 2012, when I was working at a small gas station in northeast Louisiana. We were the only small shop in 24-hour service station near Bastrop, just off the highway. I worked the night shift. I loved it. The sharing of stories with the traveling customers, that is when the rare customer showed up. It must have been around 2 a.m., I was cleaning the floors and locking the beer coolers when suddenly the lights went out. I pulled out my cell and used it as a guiding light until I made it back to our counter where I kicked on the gas generator. It lit the parking lot, the bath and the hall leading to the register. When I looked outside I could just make out the movement of the trees across the street but otherwise it was pitch black. I turned on the radio and started listening to a local station with its night owl DJ commenting on the heavy winds and cracking jokes between songs. 
Suddenly I saw some figures in the dark. I could just make them out. They seemed to be a group of kids on bikes. There were three of them. Two of them dropped their bikes and made their way to the door where they just stood there staring at me. I just stared back for a moment, waiting for them to come in. They never did. I moved around the counter and opened the door. What's up, guys? Yeah, kinda late, aren't you? I asked them, expecting them to come in. Can we use your phone? One asked, their heads tilted kinda low. I felt a little worried as I pulled my cell from my pocket and offered it to her. Sure. She looked at me and then I saw her eyes. They were solid black, almost like ink, filled orbs. No, I need the real one, she said, her face twisted into an angry snarl. I pulled the door closed and flipped the locks. No, no ma'am, you go home and get your mom's phone. They stared at me through the door for a minute longer before turning away and biking off. The next day, I had my boss check the cameras to get the pictures of the creepy kids. But the cameras had been off the whole time. Now the cameras run off the generator instead of the hall lights. I never saw the kids again. For the past few months, I've been noticing these white things in my security camera footage. They are in the trees and make the trees shake like it's a tornado beneath and make the trees sway back and forth. At first I thought it was the police watching me, but then I keep seeing so many of them in one place. There is no way it's that many cops. They are white and have like a black slit for eyes and a round black nose. They are very sneaky. Once one was hiding behind something outside and kept peeking around. Looking at my cameras like it knew I was watching, I have numerous videos and footage of all this. I tried posting to YouTube, but everyone thinks I'm crazy. It's really starting to bother me because I don't know WTH is going on with these things back when I thought they were cops, I called them Piggy Wiggy. So let's call them that these Piggy Wiggies move in the trees in like a jerking motions and climb up and down tree very fast. I have footage of these piggy wiggies, if you don't believe me. I'm into classical antiquity and thought maybe I had summoned some demons or something when I was trying to speak Latin to these telemarketers that wouldn't quit calling me every day all day, so I said some crazy stuff in Latin hoping it would spook them off like Mercury knows what you did to Babak. is coming for you. There will be no mercy, so that's another thing I thought. I know what you're thinking, but I'm not crazy. Okay. Anyways, please help if you have any idea what they piggies wiggies are. Thank you. I'm staying in Pigeon Forge near the Smoky Mountains right now and in a cabin in the woods. There's other cabins nearby, though. I was dead asleep last night and my boyfriend was still outside in the hot tub and he came inside yelling for me and woke me up he said that he started hearing something big moving around in the forest and he thought it was a bear but he shined his flashlight and it was like something small moving through the grasses that he couldn't see there were multiple of them but they were covered by the grass and moving in different directions he only saw one but it was a little ways in the distance and he described it as long and tan and skin-colored like a person that was on their belly slithering around, but moving really fast and graceful. Then clear as day, he heard a woman's voice scream, Help me, someone? And he says it was the weirdest sound, like it didn't sound like a real person. It sounded rehearsed and fake, and he couldn't tell where it was coming from. Anyone know what this is? We're freaked. I've seen what I believe was either an alien in disguise, a hologram beamed down by aliens, or some other sort of trickery they were using to lure me towards them so they could abduct me and my friends. Here is my story. It was 2001. I was driving my car on the Blue Ridge Parkway near Asheville, North Carolina. My three friends and I spent the day at a nice place called Graveyard Field. 
I was driving us home, sober by the way, late at night. We were chatting normally when all of a sudden I see a two to three foot tall, all white squirrel standing up right at the edge of the road. My headlamps illuminated it as I drove by and it turned its head to make eye contact and follow my eyes. I instantly had the thought, that is not of this world. I turned to my friends to say, did you just see that? All three of them were instantly asleep with their heads tilted to the side and resting on their shoulders. I was flabbergasted. We were just talking seconds ago and now all are asleep. About 20 seconds later I saw a second identical one. Same exact thing happened except I knew my friends were already asleep. My mind was racing. I looked at the clock. I don't think we lost any time. Then the girl in the front seat started waking up, and I excitedly told her the story. Then we saw a third one, identical to the first two. She was equally freaked out by it. I don't think they got us. That's the end of the story. However, a couple years later, I flipped through the pages of a book about UFOs. I think it was Communion by Wiley Straber. I randomly opened a book to a chapter with a drawing of an all-white deer with big black almond-shaped eyes. In the book, he interviews lots of abductees. There's a category of abductees who claim they were in the woods when they saw an all-white animal with big black almond-shaped eyes. When they walked towards it to investigate, they were abducted. This is a true story. Has anyone else ever heard of this phenomenon? I've never been one to shy away from a challenge. Twenty years as a Navy SEAL taught me that much. But nothing, absolutely nothing, could have prepared me for the mission that would turn my world upside down, challenge everything I believed in, and leave me questioning the very fabric of reality. It started as a routine search and rescue operation in the Canadian wilderness. A brutal winter storm had hit, and a group of hikers had gone missing. Our team, seasoned in survival and combat, was airlifted into the area, ready to face the elements and bring those hikers home. The wilderness of Montreal is unforgiving in the winter. The snow blankets, everything, silencing footsteps and hiding dangers. We were prepared for the cold, the isolation, and even the possibility of not finding the hikers alive. What we weren't prepared for was the horror we stumbled upon instead. Three days into the mission, we found the first body. Not just lost to the cold, but torn apart. It was a scene straight out of a nightmare. Something no animal we knew could have done. That's when we heard the stories from the locals. A tale of a creature, part man, part beast, that roamed the wilderness. A Sasquatch-like entity, they said, responsible for a series of cannibalistic murders stretching back generations, always in the deepest cold of winter. Skeptical but unnerved, we pressed on, deeper into the heart of the wilderness. The snow seemed to swallow us, the vast white expanse broken only by the dark silhouettes of towering pines, and the occasional blood-red splash against the pristine snow. Reminders of the violence that had occurred here. Then we saw them. At first, just shadows moving between the trees, too quick to be real. But as we ventured further, the encounters became more frequent, more tangible. We found tracks, enormous footprints, unlike any animal known to man, leading us into the depths of the forest. I remember the first time I saw one, truly saw one. It was twilight, the sky a deep indigo, when a figure stepped out onto the path ahead of us. It stood on two legs, towering, covered in thick, dark fur, its eyes reflecting the dying light fixed on us with an intelligence that was unmistakably human. Then it was gone, disappearing into the darkness as quickly as it had appeared. Panic set in. We were trained for combat, for survival. But how do you fight a myth? How do you battle a legend that has stalked the nightmares of men for centuries? Our mission changed then. It was no longer about search and rescue. It was about survival, about getting out of those woods alive. But they were watching us, always just out of sight, always just a step behind. We could hear them at night, 
the low guttural sounds they made communicating in a language that was as ancient as the forest itself. In the end, we discovered there weren't just one or two of them. There were tribes, entire communities that had lived hidden from the world, emerging only in the deep freeze of winter when the world was silent and white. When we finally made it back to civilization, battered, frostbitten, but alive, we told our story. We spoke of the things we had seen, the horrors we had witnessed. But the government dismissed our claims, labeled our encounter the result of stress and isolation. They sent us back to the USA with a warning to keep quiet about what we had seen. But silence is not in my nature. I know what I saw, what we all saw out there in the deep wilderness of Montreal. And while the world may not be ready to believe in creatures of myth and legend, I know the truth. I've seen it with my own eyes. So here I am, sharing my story with you. Maybe you'll believe me, maybe you won't. But if you ever find yourself in the Canadian wilderness in the dead of winter, remember my words. The world is far stranger, far more mysterious, and far more terrifying than you could ever imagine. My grandfather, a brave man who served in the Special Forces during World War II, had a story he always told us. He never lied about it, and it's a story that still sends shivers down my spine. It was the story of that one fateful night in a small German village. They were air dropped into this nondescript hamlet far behind enemy lines. Their mission was to capture and secure a small barracks for a temporary base. My grandfather and his team of elite soldiers knew the stakes were high, but they had no idea they were about to encounter something beyond their wildest nightmares. It was a dark night, the kind of night where shadows seemed to stretch infinitely. The village was shrouded in silence, and the only sounds were the hushed whispers of the team as they moved stealthily. They secured the barracks, making it their temporary refuge in the enemy territory. But then the night took a sinister turn. There was something out there lurking in the shadows. My grandfather's words painted a vivid picture of the unknown predator. He described it as being approximately eight feet tall with dark gray fur that had hints of brown. Its mane resembled that of a male lion, though shorter hair covered its body and legs. The chilling part was that it walked upright on its back legs, eerily human, like, but as it drew closer to them, it dropped onto all fours, ready to pounce. Panic ensued as the soldiers opened fire, desperate to protect themselves from the creature that had emerged from the darkness. But the beast was relentless. It lunged at one of the soldiers, tackling him to the ground with ferocious power. In the chaos that followed, the creature tore into the unfortunate soldier, his screams of agony piercing the night. The team continued to fire, bullets tearing into the night, but their efforts seemed futile against this relentless predator. It was as though it defied the laws of nature, a nightmarish aberration that should never exist. As the night wore on and the creature continued its gruesome feast, the team was forced to retreat to the relative safety of the barracks. They huddled together, fear and confusion gripping their hearts as they tried to make sense of the horrifying encounter. Morning brought no solace, no answers. When they ventured outside, the village was eerily silent and there was no trace of the creature. The fallen soldiers' remains had vanished, leaving behind only a grisly memory etched in their minds. My grandfather's story of that horrifying night always stuck with me. My husband, Errol, and I had been married for 32 years. We owned a cottage on Cable Lake in the Sister Lakes in Dalek Lock, Michigan. Our cottage was a place we cherished, but as the late 1950s rolled in, we noticed significant development in the area. Surprisingly, we found ourselves appreciating the development as it seemed to blend harmoniously with the natural beauty of the lake area. One early Friday evening in mid-July, we made the drive up to our cottage looking forward to a week-long stay. 
I stepped out to the backyard, which overlooked the lake, and took in the serene early evening. That's when I noticed something unusual on the far shore of Cable Lake. Arrow joined me, and we both spotted an animal on the far shore. Look at that, Arrow remarked. I couldn't take my eyes off the creature. We were transfixed, mesmerized. We didn't know what it was. It was clearly wildlife, but due to the distance and the weeds, we couldn't make out its identity, I recalled. Then it stood up. I shuddered, saying, The thing stared as though it were looking at us. I don't know what was more frightening, seeing that giant animal standing like a man, or the fact that it seemed to be looking at us. Errol told the Chicago Sun-Times, I think we were only curious until it took a step into the lake toward us. Then it was walking into the lake toward us. I got scared and took Sally inside. Inside the house, we discussed what we had seen and what we should do about it. Errol didn't want to involve the sheriff, suspecting it might have been a prank by local teenagers. We decided to go back to our rear porch for drinks to relax. But instead of enjoying the sunset, we noticed bubbles trailing toward our beach below. That's when we knew something was terribly wrong. We rushed back inside to call the police, trying to be cautious with our choice of words to avoid sounding paranoid. As the sun set on the lake, Errol recalled me gasping. I knew something was terribly wrong. I was looking out of the beach window. I dropped the phone and ran over and saw it, a large, long-armed creature standing on our beach. It was glistening wet and just staring up at our house. Years later, I affirmed, we ran for the car. Arrow backed out, and that thing was already standing behind us. We drove away, but something was wrong with the car. There was a loud bang and a scrape, but we kept driving. I later asserted that thing was some kind of supernatural being. We made the difficult decision to sell our cherished cottage and never return. At first, our neighbors reported loud noises, but when questioned further, we chose not to discuss the matter. It wasn't until 1972, after Errol and I had retired to Florida, that we confided in a former neighbor who still maintained a property in the area. This revelation was later confirmed by Sheldon Stein, who was doing research on a vacation home circular for Chicago residents. I'm not a creepy person. I don't have a creepy life. I've never had a scary story to tell, none that were true up until now, and I'm not trying to be dramatic with that. I'm scared, but nothing significant has happened to be honest with you. I'm posting this here because I know you guys are the only ones who would uh, listen and B, actually give me advice. I live in a rural area. The only house even close to me is roughly two miles away, the next being ten plus. I have no family, really. I do have a girlfriend. She stays for a few days here and there. Enough backstory. Every now and again, I will go outside behind my house, in the woods, and just walk. I'll sometimes find old things, old coca, cola bottles, old roller skates, even half a toilet once. It's just interesting. I'll do it usually in the mornings that I'm off of work. Recently, my girlfriend was over. It was nearing night and we got into a little argument about something I won't go into here, I ended up deciding I was going to just walk away so it wouldn't escalate. So I do what I do and go out back. I walk for nearly a mile when it hits me. Shit, the sun went down fast. I decide to start making my way back, and then it starts. This sound. This god-awful, horrifying sound. I don't get scared easily living out here. You hear a lot at night. There have been black bears in my yard. But this, this is something else. It sounded like an old man was choking and screaming for help in a different language. I know that might sound boring, but once you hear it, it's terrible. I stop in my tracks and wedge myself into a nearly hollow dying tree's trunk. While doing so, I also scream, Hey, who's there? Yeah, all right. I'm scared shitless, but if it is someone I don't want to say, I didn't try. I guess. I don't hear it now. 
It's completely dark at this point, so I try to think about what it could be and how I'm getting home as the sound had came from the direction of my house. I wait for probably 30 minutes in that tree. I decided this. I'm a man and I have to get home. Then that movie-like moment happens when I step out of the tree and immediately hear it again, this time louder but in the opposite direction. Had it passed me without my knowing, or was there another? I had no clue, but I'm not leaving this tree. I hear it several more times over the course of 30-plus minutes. I'm ashamed as a 27-year-old man that I stayed the night in the woods in the tree until morning. I never really slept, but I wasn't necessarily awake, if you know what I mean. On the border between the two the whole time, every time I thought I heard something, it would jolt me awake. Then I would slowly drift off again, and so on. The sun began to rise, and I decided to stay awake at this point. I was wide awake for nearly an hour before I decided to make a run for my house. I get home, burst in the back door, and cue the girlfriend where the F were you. I was worried, and you just left in our fight. Answer me. I deserved all of that and more. I waited a second before telling her that I went for a walk to blow off some steam and just decided to sleep in the barn in the woods about a mile and a half behind the house. She bought it, but I was still scared. Night came again. My girlfriend decided to spend another night because she didn't feel right leaving the day after a fight. I was so happy. She's an early sleeper. When nine came around, she had enough of being awake and decided to head to bed, telling me she'd wake me in the morning before she left. I usually don't go to bed until around 12, 1 a.m. I sit watching TV for about an hour, then I grab my dad's old shotgun. I don't hunt, but I keep it for safety. I put on a headlamp, put a box of bullets, water, a lighter, and a flashlight in my bag, and went out back. I walked to the same tree, got in. It is large enough to sit Indian, style in, just the entrance is small, and waited. I waited for two plus hours. It's here. I hear that sound again. And again. And now in harmony. There had to be at least four. I clenched the gun. It was loaded. And I was ready to see what the hell this was. But read it. I forgot that I'm a wuss. I sat there waiting like a coward this time, however, I noticed. None of the sounds were coming from the direction of my house. So before they started coming from that direction... I tucked my tail between my legs and jogged home, trying not to be too loud. I got home and googled everything I could think of. Animals that sound like men, old men sound from woods, animals known to my area, and kept going in this pattern, and I kept clicking on everything. Then a website with audio files came my way. I clicked play on one of the files, and my heart stopped. It was the sound the exact sound. It was uncanny. I looked at the title of the auto, and it was titled Samurai Chatter. I looked up the exact phrase, and I'm not saying I believe in Sasquatch, but that's all that came up. That it was supposedly their language. I don't know what it is, but I have heard it. I'm not stopping here. I have a cousin coming over this weekend who's agreed to hike out there with me and look for it. My girlfriend knows nothing of it. Wish me luck. While you're at it, Google Samurai Chatter. Two nights ago, I was driving home around 3 a.m. and did a rolling stop through an intersection in a suburban area. I looked to the right as I was crossing the intersection and saw a humanoid creature sitting cross, leg in the middle of the street to the right. It was hunched over with its back towards me. The creature was naked, bald, and completely hairless. I couldn't completely judge its height because of its position, but it appeared to be around six feet tall, quite thin, and extremely, extremely pale, nearly completely white skin, not what I would consider a normal human skin tone. I couldn't reverse to have a second look because there was a car a few paces behind me, but the driver behind me turned right and just kept going as if nothing was there. After a slight hesitation, I pulled over and got out of my car to check the scene, but the creature was nowhere to be seen. Does anyone have any ideas about what I might have spotted? I'm very sure that whatever it was wasn't a human, 
or at least not one that looks like any I've seen before. Okay, first off, I'm not sure this is a crawler, however, that is the closest thing to it that I can find. It seems to share many similarities with them, but I don't know. I'm interested in thoughts of what it may be. Note, this all happened a long time ago, and the dates and my age are the best of my recollection. I moved to a rural area of the North Georgia or Alabama mountains. Sand Mountain was the name of the place. It was connected to Dade County, Georgia, but right over the state line in Higgin, Alabama. I was around eight years old. When I first got there, it was a total culture shock having moved from a large urban area in the southwest. I vividly remember driving through a virtual the sea of green right outside of Atlanta. The novelty of the trees soon wore off, and I dove back into a book to stave off the boredom of a long drive to my new home. At some point, I started to feel really uneasy, so I told my mom. She wrote it off as a symptom if the major life change or something to that effect. I did my best to just accept it as nothing more than that, but the anxiety and sense of oppression got a lot worse. It seemed that that heavy feeling directly correlated to the proximity to my new home. That was a feeling that I would live with for more than a decade. I would soon find out that it was nothing in relation to what I would soon experience. I can't say how long it was until it started, but it, it had to be a few months after we moved into a little trailer at the end of a long driveway. In the clearing of the woods, our closest neighbor was well over a mile away. My room was on the opposite end of the trailer as my mother and her husband's room. I had a huge bay window, which will be important in a minute. So it all started kinda odd one night I couldn't sleep, despite being tired from exploring the acres of woods that I now resided in. So I'm lying there, cartoon network in the dark, trying to fall asleep. Very suddenly, I'm deep in the woods in the southeast of the property. It was a place that I had been before, but not really much all thing I did recognize it. It was the strangest feeling like being a passenger in another's mind, seeing through their eyes, but having no control, just along for the ride. It was disorienting, to say the least. It exponentially worsened when whatever it was started to move. It was an unnatural speed, predatory and precise kind of reminiscent of the way an animal would stalk its prey, darting from cover to cover tree to tree. It was a blur until it stopped again, just giving me the time I needed to regain my bearings as much as I was able. This only lasted for a few seconds, and I sat back to my own body again, laying in bed. It was such a strange feeling, and I didn't want to even think about it. I didn't want it to be real. The next night it happened again, and the next and the next, after a few days, I realized that each time it was for a bit longer, and it definitely seemed to allow me to see through it for longer each night. I can't say how long this lasted, but it was long enough to be a commonplace event every night. One night, I was coming up to the clearing that the trailer was in. As I realized this, though, my consciousness was in this thing's mind to some degree. An all-consuming sense of dread started to rise up in me worsening with every brief pace behind cover. No thinking back this thing didn't seem to operate in any sense of time and space that we are accustomed to, because it would pick up every night in the place that I left its mind, or whatever, but I don't think it was us frozen there till the next day. I think it was playing some sort of game or something kind of like when an orca plays with a seal or a cat with a mouse. As my terror reached a crescendo, I was suddenly ejected back to myself. I don't know if I did it or it had killed whatever link it had made or what, but it was different this time. I sat straight up and turned toward the window. I just knew that it was there, that it was a few feet outside of the tree line. As much as I didn't want to, I still gathered myself up and looked out that bay window at the tree line. It was there, leaning from behind a large tree, right at the edge of the woods. 
It was tall, very tall, and its skin was taut like it was stretched over its bones. But I don't really remember any detail of its skeletal anatomy. All its features were grotesquely elongated like they were stretched out purposely. It had long clawed fingers that curled around into the common sign that you would use to beckon someone closer to you. Its face was large and humanoid, but with that same stretched out look. It had a smile that was impossibly wide and large, long sharp teeth, skinny and needle-like. Its eyes were really big, even with that for its size. It just stood there staring at me through my window, cocked its head, and motioned for me to come to it. I call it the Gray Man, although it had no discernible gender. It was an animal terror, unlike anything I have ever felt, but I found myself having to actively fight an almost uncontrollable impulse to go out to it. It was like it could almost compelling me to go with it to the forest. After what seemed like forever, I was able to pull myself away from the window and crawl back into bed. All I could do the rest of that night was wait for it to get tired of waiting and decide to come to me. It never did, and when the sun finally came out, I couldn't feel it anymore. This was the new normal for me. Almost every night it would come back and wait and watch. The compulsion lessened eventually, though, which was the only real silver lining. I stopped sleeping a lot and would spend the nights in the living room as much as I could, which wasn't often. After quite some time of living with this thing appearing all the time in different places, it got closer at night. I don't have a total memory of this night exactly, or I guess I should say that I don't have a complete memory. I think I gave it away in something else. After being plagued by this thing for quite a while, it was really getting to me. I wasn't sleeping, which affected lots of other areas of my life. This in connection with a tumultuous environment was quickly pushing me to a breaking point. One night I awoke to this thing, something different perched on the bottom railing of my bed. The only way I can describe it was kind of like the fawn from Pan's Labyrinth. It looked much different than that character, but it's as close to an analog as I can come up with. It told me that it would get rid of the gray man, but for a price. The fawn had a different energy to it than the gray man did, but I don't think it was something that was of good intent, a mild, almost predatory opportunism at best. I was, however, desperate and exhausted, so whatever it wanted from me, whatever price it required, I paid it. It did indeed keep up its end of the bargain until I ended up accidentally opening up the door for this thing to re-enter. Some years later, my life did return to a kind of normal well in some ways. When I was 20, I had a job driving a long-haul truck in one fateful night. I found myself on the lonesome road heading home around 10 p.m., my place was situated several miles north of town, right off a quiet state highway, a route I had traveled countless times. As I cruised down the dark, desolate road, my mind wandered through the events of the day, and I could feel the fatigue settling in. The only source of light was my truck's headlights, casting a small bubble of visibility ahead. But then something caught my eye, a glowing orb rising above one of the mountains. At first I thought it was the moon, as it appeared to be a perfect round sphere, bathed in that pale ethereal light. But then the strangest thing happened. This moon began moving at a speed no celestial body should ever be capable of. It darted behind the mountain, as if it had somewhere to be, leaving me bewildered and staring after it. I continued my journey, albeit with an uneasy feeling in the pit of my stomach. The rest of the drive home was spent wrestling with thoughts of what I had just witnessed. Something about it was entirely off, kilter, and it didn't sit right with me. The full moon should never move like that. By the time I reached home, I was super freaked out. Before heading inside, I took one last look at the night sky, perhaps hoping for a rational explanation or some sign that it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. And there it was, high up in the sky the real moon, casting its soft, silvery glow on the world. 
Whatever I had seen earlier darting behind that mountain was unquestionably not the moon. I shuddered at the thought of what it might have been. It remained an unsettling mystery, one that would haunt my thoughts for nights to come. As a professional trucker, I had crisscrossed countless highways and byways, but several years back I found myself in an eerily memorable situation while visiting my best buddy in Vernal, Utah. He'd forewarned me about a stretch of highway notorious for violent crimes, mysterious disappearances, and chilling tales of scalpings. At the time, I'd brushed off his warning as a ribbing, convinced he was just messing with me, so I playfully called him out on it. It was a beautiful sunny day when I departed Vernal to make my way back to Idaho a couple of weeks later, just as the clock ticked close to midnight. The terrain was shrouded in darkness as I pressed forward on the lonesome road. My skepticism about my friend's ominous tales had me at ease. After all, my daytime journey had been nothing more than a routine drive. However, as the minutes rolled by, a sense of unease started to creep in. Suddenly, my truck's headlights caught something up ahead, sending a shiver down my spine. There, in the middle of the road, was an SUV, its emergency blinkers flashing desperately, and its driver and passenger doors wide open. It straddled the highway, partially blocking both lanes. My heart raced, and my mind raced back to the warnings from my friend, his stories about this very road. The bizarre occurrences, the inexplicable disappearances, they all came rushing back. I knew I couldn't afford to take any chances. My foot slammed the accelerator and I made a split, second decision to veer off the road, just enough to slip past the open doors of the stranded SUV without stopping. I live in Greene County in southwestern Pennsylvania and have been a firefighter for over 15 years. We have a ghost in our fire department. It's an old member who died many years ago, and many of our members, myself included, have had experiences with Uncle Al, as we call him. There have been many times where someone has experienced sounds, noises, and just odd feelings while being in the fire department. We have had a game room added to our department. After our member had already died, so he cannot pass into the new room, but you can feel his presence in the doorway. One of the most memorable experiences I have had with Uncle Al was one day when I was in the engine bay office with two members, Ken and myself. This has occurred before, when I was alone. We could hear chairs being knocked off of the tables in our social hall. We went upstairs to investigate, and all the chairs looked like they were pushed off the tables. Ken and I went back downstairs and left everything as is, and not long later, maybe ten minutes, we heard the chairs moving again. We went back upstairs, and all the chairs were set back up onto the tables. I'm not making this up. Another experience with Uncle Al occurred when I was standing in the bathroom, which is in the social hall, the part where Al can roam around. It was about midnight, and I looked out the window at least five minutes previous and noticed no members' cars except mine were in the lot. Soon I heard someone calling my name. The sounds were coming from the doorway to the stairwell. I can also hear people walking around in the bays again and people stepping on the grates on the floor. I went downstairs to investigate, looking out the window again. There were no cars in the lot. I go to the door to the engine bays and see that the lights are off. There is always the sense of being watched by Uncle Al, be it one person or ten people in the firehouse. You can always feel the presence of someone or something watching you. Denver Airport, 1.30 a.m. I was ill and traveling all the way from NYC to Colorado to see a physician who specialized in A.C., Bladder disease that mimics cancer. I have never been in a huge airport, and it was very quiet. Few people and I had no idea where to go off these subway train things. Plus, no one was around for me to ask, which way do I go? 
As I was standing in this tunnel after getting off the train, I was looking around and down the long hallways for a bathroom. Part of my medical issue is a constant need to urinate. Anyway, I saw a weird, very tall sculpture, kind of like a dinosaur, but with alligator skin and a lizard face with big eyes. It didn't move, and because I saw a lot of weird things at the main entry of the airport, I assumed it was another freaky art thing. But my phone rang. It was Dr. Brookoff asking if I was at the airport. As I turned to go in the direction he explained to me, the weird, tall, lizard-looking thing was gone just vanished. This was in March of 2006. Dr. Brookoff has passed since then, and in my opinion, under suspicious circumstances. At that time, I hadn't heard of reptilians. I was watching Conspiracy Theory with Jesse Ventura and looked it up. I know what I saw now, 100% sure that was a reptilian. I am so grateful to God and Dr. Brookoff for picking me up that night. The Denver International Airport definitely has some strange murals and other oddities. I wrote a piece in November 2011, which I posted below. I don't know what Heidi Jo witnessed, but her story doesn't surprise me. There's been a variety of speculation since the facility opened in 1994, including several conspiracy theories about underground tunnels and symbolism used in art throughout the concourse and terminals. I've heard that certain groups are tied to the airport, including the Illuminati and the Freemasons, that the Denver area is where the establishment of the Western sector of the New World Order will be in the United States. The capstone, or the dedication stone, for the Denver airport does have a Masonic symbol on it, but many other public buildings throughout the world do as well. It has been said that Phil Schneider of Dulf Space fame said that during the last year of the airport construction, they were connecting the underground airport system to a deep underground base. He stated that there was at least an eight-level deep underground base there and that there was a four-square-mile underground city and an 88-square-mile bow base underneath the airport. Many of these supposed deep underground facilities located in the United States have been linked to the congregation of alien beings, including greys and reptilians. I'm sure that you can find the interview online. For many years, I've been receiving inquiries about the Denver International Airport and the strange anomalies that supposedly occur there. A former Denver Broncos player told me that he would absolutely freaked out each time he and the team would fly out of there and that he wasn't the only person on the team to express their discontent with the place. Okay, this took a lot of courage because I've been ridiculed so much for what happened to me. My grandfather owned a cabin. I'm not disclosing the location of it due to the fact that I don't want anything to happen to anyone. Anyway, my grandfather's cabin was his way of getting the family together for the holidays so he could have a nice Sunday dinner with all of us. One day, all of a sudden, that all stopped abruptly. He wouldn't allow anyone but himself to visit the cabin. We all looked forward to going to and cherished. For years, I would ask him why he was doing that. He never told me why, but when he passed, he left the place to me. I inherited the cabin of my childhood and was ecstatic about that. It was soon after that I realized why he did. What he did, I would go out and walk the woods on game trails, which are everywhere. I know these woods like I know my own home, so I never had any reason to fear them. It was on one of these walks that I encountered what people called dogmen. I was walking just like any other time. Nothing was different. It was then, on one of the game trails, I noticed an offshoot, small trail that went only six to seven feet back. I could see that something had bedded down there. I thought it was a deer. I then walked in the bedded area. I soon realized that this was an ambush point for whatever made this bedded area, and it was massive. My arm hair stood erect, and a chill literally ran down my spine. I felt as if I was being watched from different vantage points. Since it was nighttime, I had a tracking flashlight in my sidearm, the latter of which I drew and kept at the ready. 
I genuinely feared for my life at this point. All of a sudden, an ungodly growl was made to my right, about 10 to 15 yards from me, very close indeed. I pissed myself. It was so terrifying. I didn't immediately run, fearing that whatever it was might take me as threatening. I turned and started heading back on the main trail, and when I was about five minutes from the back door of my cabin, this thing let out a howl that I swear felt like it went right through my body. I then proceeded to run. As soon as I did, this thing was chasing me. For every five steps I took, this thing was taking one. That's how fast this dogman was. I heard the sounds of branches being ripped off trees, and I could have sworn I felt the vibrations of it running after me. I barely made it to my cabin and slammed the door, locking the two deadbolts and chain lock. I then turned on my spotlight and shined it into the tree line. There were three sets of eyes in the tree line that shined vivid yellow with enormous black pupils. I felt as if the thing could read my mind, but I'm not sure it could. All I know is that I'm alive and have since heard them many times, but I don't take night hikes and more in heaven for years. That night, my buddy and I were camping on an open hill that is frequently stopped on by hikers during the days the trail is open. We were both having trouble getting to sleep, so we decided to play some cards, which I had packed in my bag at about this time was when our fire was getting quiet and it was dimming. The time was 1, 10 a.m., just minutes after I had taken out my cards and started dealing them out. I heard the strangest sound. It's hard to explain what it sounded like, but... I'll try. It was like someone trying to gasp for air, but in a creepy, high-pitched sound. The noise was sporadic and hair-raising. We stopped talking and gave each other a look. He said it must be some sort of bird. But in the pitch dark of the first morning hours, and these were deep noise I heard. Not some. Damn bird. I wanted to believe my friend, but couldn't I start getting drowsy due to a long day of hiking? I fell into a light sleep, still keeping in mind what I had. A rustling in some bushes had awoken me, but not my friend. I sat up, bumping my head on the hot lantern that had been out for almost twenty minutes. I looked around as if I could actually see anything outside the tent. I heard heavy yet quiet footsteps on the light dirt and gravel ground. Slowly, I reached into the stuffed sack where I kept my skin-diving knife. As I was carefully sliding it out of the sheath, I heard the crumpling of the power bar wrappers that had been already half-eaten. That's when my friend awoke with the words, What the hell is outside our tent? I didn't answer. The crumpling of the wrappers continued as it did. The smell became apparent. It smelled like rotten eggs mashed over a greasy, sweaty athlete. Then a huge body rubbed against our tent from the dent in the dark. I could tell this being was enormous. Eventually the smell was gone and we both were awake till dawn. We had packed in the dark when there didn't seem to be a threat. So when dawn came, we quickly pulled down our two-person tent and got the F out of Dodge. We were transiting the Straits of Hormuz at night, probably 1970. One and suddenly held a radar contact close and dead ahead. Its position relative to us was steady bearing, decreasing range as if a vessel was going to collide with our destroyer. The Ud and the rest of the bridge watch saw no lights or any evidence of an approaching vessel. Minutes go by, tension mounts. The captain is called to the bridge. The radar contact gets closer and closer until it disappears at the center of our radar scope. No collision. There was no vessel, as it turns out. In checking later, the navigation chart showed a high overhead cable that was reflecting and returning our radar beam. Not me, but my father back in his commercial fishing days noticed that there was a t-shirt in the middle of his net after one toe. After a little investigation, he found that it was not a shirt, but a human torso wearing a shirt. He said he was terrified that he would open the net and a head would roll out onto his feet, but it didn't happen. 
His captain radioed ahead, and they brought the torso back to the docks, where they were met by the police and a coroner. They were eventually able to identify the body, based on the clothing, as a victim of a plane crash that had occurred fairly recently. My dad said he offered a free lobster to the coroner, who graciously accepted it until he found out that it had been found in the net with the body. After that, he got angry and told him to throw it back. I had an old teacher in high school that used to be in the Navy. He told us stories about how he had to repair the things at the top of the pole that stick straight out from the center of the ship. Yes, my naval terminology is crap. Think it was related to a satellite or just a light bulb or something. Anyways, he says that when you're so high up and the ocean is tilting the boat from side to side, you're basically above the water instead of above the deck of the boat. If you were to fall off at that moment, you'd land directly into the black ocean. He said there were times when he had to climb up to talk down one of the new guys who couldn't climb down. I'm in the Navy, and at the time of this anecdote, I was part of a security detachment for a freighter off the coast of Iran. It was a few hours into my watch probably around one on a gun mount, when a small fishing vessel near the horizon starts beaming our ship with a high-powered laser pointer. This is actually a pretty common occurrence in the area, but I reported to my superior to make sure they were aware. About two or three minutes later, I look back over to where the vessel was to check on it, and it's gone. It was the middle of the night in the ocean, but my naked eyes should have picked up the boat with relative ease. I put on my night vision goggles and scanned the same area forward of the ship. Nothing. Literally nothing. No vessel, no stars, no horizon. Just nothing. I felt like I was tired. Perhaps my night watch was getting to my head. I took off the goggles and did some jumping jacks and push-ups for a few minutes and took another look. That's when I saw it, an impending wall of gray. No start, no beginning. Just gray. Fog, heavy, thick fog, thicker than any fog I've ever seen. With the moments every metal surface was coated in mist, I could not see more than twenty or so feet in any direction. It was eerie the civilians piloting the ship didn't use any horns or anything. We just sailed through the dense cloud. I couldn't even see the water. My only perception of speed was the thick mist moving past me. Luckily, nothing happened. But when you are standing an armed watch on a big freighter near Iran, in waters that have had reports of pirates, and your most important sense is taken away from you, I couldn't help but imagine what could happen as we moved through that dense fog for what seemed like twenty minutes. One late night, around 3 a.m., I was sitting at my home on PC, watching movies, playing games, etc., when I noticed him out of cigarettes. The only thing that works late at night is our local gas station, not too far from my home, but still, it's easier to go with car. I took my car keys and locked my house, and I went to gas station. I live in small European country, which is the most safe country on planet, still. That doesn't mean that some bad things don't happen here and there. When you exit from a suburban area where I live, you need to take right so you can take main road. After that, you just go straight for about half kilometer and then go left for another half kilometer to get to gas station. On halfway, I notice some girl on sidewalk. I usually drive slower at night because at that time a lot of people would speed and go on red during the night time walking faster than usual. It looked like she panicked, and I noticed two guys behind her who were like ten feet away. Maybe less pointing at her and do some hand gestures towards her. They gave me a really creepy vibe. As I was getting close to girl, I noticed she had scary face on, like she was about to cry but didn't cry, so I pulled over close to her and said very quietly, Are you in trouble? and she just looked at me and noted with head nodding. I told her to get in car, and she did. 
I told her I'm going to gas station to get some cigarettes, but I will take her home as soon as I finish buying cigarettes. She thanked me for like hundred times. I asked if she want to go to report it to police, but she said only to take her home. I went to gas station and bought me a cigarette and a bottle of water for her. She was clearly in fear. I took her home after that. We passed the same street where those two guys followed her, but those guys are never to be seen. Imagine if I didn't run out of cigarettes that night. When I was a kid, probably around 12, 13, my mom moved out to this farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. Like we couldn't get internet middle of nowhere. It was a property with 13 acres, a dilapidated barn and horse corral that had overgrown weeds and of course the main farmhouse. At night, there was no lights other than the one in the front yard to show that our electric was working. My room had a window that faced the horse corral. One night, I woke up in the middle of the night. It was a full moon. I looked out my window, and beside one of the fence posts of the corral, there was a girl standing there. She was wearing a nightgown and rubber boots. She was facing my window. From there, things got worse. The TV we had in our basement would turn on and off randomly. My mom would hear an old radio playing in the middle of the night. My stepmom would go out to the barn to smoke. One time she was in there, she, her, a uh, girl say her name, she thought it was me. But at that time, I was at my dad's house in the city. When I would wake up in the middle of the night to pee or to get water, I would feel like someone was watching me. If I looked into our living room, it felt like someone was watching me through the window. One day, my stepmom and I were walking down the hallway, and we both saw a nightgown go into the bathroom. No one was in there when we checked. This all came to a head when one night I woke up randomly again in the middle of the night. I used to keep my room door open, and it would look out to the hallway of our house. I was laying in bed, unable to fall back asleep, when as clear as day, I heard a girl whisper my name. At first I thought it was a noise my sheets made when I moved. I tried recreating the noise, but it didn't work. Then I looked out into the hallway, and standing in my doorway was a dark figure of a girl wearing a nightgown. I stared at it and unable to move. I turned on my bedside lamp, and no one was there. It looked everything in my body to run down the hallway into my mom's room, where I slept for the night. For unrelated reasons, we moved out of the house shortly after. With spooky season upon us, I decided to share a true story that happened to my mom. This is mostly anecdotal, so I will try to explain what my mom told me. When I was a teenager, my mom was a kitchen worker at a local junior high school. The school was pretty old and had many legends about death through the years. When she started there, the other workers would tell her stories about the school being haunted. She wasn't a believer until she encountered the most terrifying experience that shook her. The lunch period was over. They were all sitting at one of the tables having their lunch before cleaning up. Next to the main serving station was the storage closest. Inside was the cleaning supplies, and it had its own spray holes to clean the floors. As they were eating their lunch, they heard the hose in the closet turn on. They quickly ran to the closet to shut it off. When they opened the door, the hose was turned on full blast, and it was whipping around like crazy. One of the ladies stepped in to grab the hose. Once she stepped forward, the hose dropped in midair, turned directly towards her, and shot straight for her head. She quickly slammed the door before it hit her. They ran out so fast, completely terrified without shutting the hose off. She was crying when she got home. She was so terrified. I went there myself after to explore and also had terrifying experiences with music coming over the PA system with the school empty. There are a lot more stories to share from that school. It has since been torn down and the school was rebuilt. I always wonder if that got rid of whatever was there or if that school is still haunted to this day. My wife and I had an experience yesterday. 
and I'd never have believed in the paranormal until now. I believed there was some sort of afterlife, but after this event, I'm a billion percent certain now. Our beloved dog princess, our baby, passed away in January a little before her twelfth birthday. We both brought her up yesterday in conversation, and it brought tears to our eyes because of how deeply we love and miss her. Sometimes I feel like I hear the taps of her paws on the wooden floors, and I still get the feeling to look down to not trip over her when I walk around the house, and it makes me sad, but brings me comfort at the same time because it feels like she's still with us. I left the room, and apparently my wife asked our puppy to give us a sign to tell us that she's okay. I didn't know she did this until after the events happened. Well, a few hours later, we were watching TV, and I turned to the left to take my medicine, and I saw a small, bead-sized orb of light covered in white hairs, similar to a dandelion if the seed stems were white, too. It appeared right in my vision about two feet away and flew about a foot in one second away from me, and vanished. I waved it off as a mosquito because it's been really bad here lately, and why the hell would I just assume I saw an orb anyways? I've been open to ghosts and UFOs in the past, but I've never seen any, so I don't quite believe yet and assumed it to be a natural explanation. An hour later, I brought some food back home, and as I sat down, it reappeared about a foot, and the foot had left off me, and I saw it immediately. And I saw every detail, each individual hair, down to the little glowing white spherical core. It traveled to the right about a foot until it was six inches in front of my chest when it vanished into thin air. My first thought was that it was a fuzz, but a fuzz doesn't fly against the wind current of our A key. A fuzz also doesn't have a glowing white spherical core. It finally clicked in my dumb scientific skeptic brain, and I gasped and exclaimed, Babe, I just saw an orb. She turned to look at me with shock and said, You saw an orb, too. I just saw one. She said it was white with blue hue, similar in size to the one I saw. In the corner up there on the ceiling, it was there for one second, and then it vanished. She questioned if it could have been a reflection, but thought it wasn't possible at that spot away from the window with the black blinds closed. It was then that she told me that she asked our puppy to give us a sign that she's okay a few hours before, and we both realized that it must be our little pupper spirit. I am so skeptical that she had to appear twice. I understand that you'd have to see it to believe it, because that's the kind of person I am but I was able to see the orb about six inches from my face, and it was so bizarre because it looked realer than real as it was three-dimensional and traveled a good distance as I locked my eyes onto it. I felt as if I could have grabbed it out of the air, but was absolutely gobsmacked and in shock. Anyway, it brought both excitement and peace in knowing that the afterlife is an absolute reality to me, now and that supernatural things are real and can happen. I hope other people can experience it because the videos all feel fake and it brought tears of joy to our eyes. I never write, but I have been reading so many stories on here, so I figure I would tell one of my own. Background. I live in a small town, but in the popular fancy neighborhood that everyone made sure to hit up on Halloween night because of full-size candy bars. My family lives on a dead end and in the deepest part of this small neighborhood, which contains my aunt's house, sister's, and mine. My house was the oldest house, as well as the first house to be built before the whole neighborhood, before it was all woods, as far as I know. My aunt is very creative and artistic, so she turned this trail in her backyard to a secret garden. It was full of old angel statues, old bird fountain, a bench, and just a lot of woods. Me and my cousins always played in these woods when we were kids until we heard the old man. Note, by the garden, there was a super old shed made of tin, and it was there before my house. I'm guessing. 
Also, about 100 feet away, a slab of old busted concrete the size of another shed covered by a ton of leaves and dirt. Just thought I would add that. The beginning, I was around eight or nine years old, and after school, I wanted to go play at my cousin's house like I usually did. So I walked up to the driveway, and my older cousin, male, 12, was playing with a basketball and stopped to ask me if I have heard the old man. I was obviously confused and asked what he was talking about. He then pointed at the secret garden and said, listen. So we went quiet, and in that instance all you heard was moaning like someone was in pain. After hearing it for over five minutes, I ran home as it never stopped. My cousin informed my aunt about the noises we were hearing, and she just thought it was nothing and brushed it off since we were young and always played pretend in the woods. But the noise never stopped. It would grow louder or be very quiet, but never stop. The next day, my older cousin, male, 12, had a friend that lived in the next yard over, male, that had a unique name. He decided to cut through the woods, as he usually did, to get to my cousin's house, only to be stopped. He heard his name being called through the woods that went further back, and he was there for a few minutes, I'm guessing confused. My aunt noticed him. The kitchen window had a view of the garden. Walking out and immediately dropped everything yelling and running to him, checking and making sure he was unharmed and okay, which freaked us out because she didn't believe us about the old man. The neighbor then said someone was calling for him in the woods, groaning his name loud. He ended up getting homeschooled, even though his dad was a public school teacher, and he stopped coming over. At my house, our woods are connected, and in my backyard we have a huge shop my dad and his friend worked out of. My dad's friend was alone working in a shop with all the shop doors open and began to hear the moaning noise even over the machine equipment. So he walked down the hill to check out the noise, and it stopped. He went back to work, heard the noise again, and this repeated several times before he just left. Soon after this, my aunt freaked out and called the police. The police heard the noise. All I remember is them saying is we didn't find a body or anything else after hours of searching our woods. This wouldn't be the first time the police were called either. At some point, the groaning stopped, maybe a week or two. When it started back, my aunt had called the police again to come and double-check. Again, they found nothing. My aunt was most likely terrified and try not to show it. She went around surrounded areas nearby a logging company. Other houses a mile away from the woods to try and get answers if they have heard it or if they are making the noises. Then my aunt started holding prayer groups with women from her church to come and pray over her home. This happened a few times. I remember seeing around nine women in a circle praying and holding hands over the yard for minutes. The moaning stopped, and we never played in the secret garden again. I will never know the truth to what we heard. Hello, it's my first time writing something like this. I can't find any information regarding what my family is experiencing, but it's weird and happening more often. I live with my girlfriend and our three kids. Our house has two floors. The second floor has the rooms, and the first floor consists of the living room, bathroom, kitchen, and a small hall located behind our living room. Now, what is happening is that I'm a firefighter, which means I work in shifts and I have to work at night. When I'm at home, everything is calm. However, once in a while, we hear loud noises like something beating on an object or bags falling seemingly out of nowhere. It's rare, but does happen. On the first floor, both my girlfriend and I feel a very strong negative presence, particularly from the bathroom and the hallway. I usually close the bathroom door, which helps me feel at ease. Sometimes I feel like someone is watching my back, especially at night when everyone is asleep. The feeling is so strong that I often turn off the TV and go upstairs. Now, the worst part is that most of the activity occurs at night when I'm at work. My girlfriend and my kids feel really scared to go to the bathroom or the first floor. They say that they feel watched and have a sense of dread. 
My girlfriend and I avoid discussing these things with the kids around, so it's strange that they seem to see the same things. My girlfriend says that sometimes when she turns around, she sees in the hallway or in the dark a small, faceless black head that is always watching her. She even mentioned seeing a reflection of it when the TV turned off suddenly. My older child has also been saying that he sees a black head in the corners, watching him. He has never heard us talking about it. One night, all three of them woke up with nightmares, and they all screamed at the same time, saying that they saw a big shadow in the middle of their room. My girlfriend and I woke up with their screams, turned on the lights, but saw nothing. They managed to sleep with our presence, but the middle one is so scared that he pees in his bed instead of going to the bathroom at night. Last night, while I was at work and upon returning home, my girlfriend told me that she was in our bed with our older child, and out of nowhere, she saw a small shadow jump onto the older kid's bed. Our older child saw it too and said to her, See, I told you there was a shadow watching us. That's when she had chills. She also mentioned that during the night they heard loud knocking downstairs. At 3 a.m., our younger kid screamed in panic, and she saw a black, faceless head and some hands in the corner of the stairs, leading downstairs. At 7 a.m., she screamed again, saying that the black, shadowy head was now on top of her, watching, and that the face was a she. My girlfriend mentioned that the head is really common, but it only watches them and disappears once spotted. What could it be? What can I do? Thanks. Okay, so just to preface this, this was on Friday the 27th, and my friend and I had smoked cannabis before going out to eat and catch a movie. So my friend and I are in line at BK and trying to decide if we want to split a meal or get separate meals. My friend orders her food, and when I get to order, I get straight as asked if we smoked weed. My first thought and question was, is it that noticeable? Now I could barely hear this guy because he was speaking low, but was asking about a certain strain that I could really care less about. But it gets to the point where he tells me how much I could get for a certain price point, which I said I would keep in mind. Now my friend, and so didn't spray any perfume or body spray, we normally do but completely forgot to. I get to the table my friend picked out, and I start telling her about what just happened. Not even a minute after I sit down does this guy come over and pass me a folded-up napkin of this weed to sample. Now my friend and I are just shocked in talking about this. I ended up putting the napkin in my bra because it was the only place I could. I had no pockets. This guy ends up coming to our table three, four more times within the span of 15-20 minutes. When I went up to get my food before these other encounters occurred, this guy had let me know that he got off at 7, 30 p.m., and asked if we wanted to hang out. I straight up said that my friend and I were on a date and were going to a movie straight after this. After I got my food, this guy stopped at our table to ask what movies were playing, what his name was. I don't remember what he said, just that it has something to do with California's state bird, and the other times I can't remember why he came over. He just spoke to me and not my friend, and I could tell this guy was trying to get some information on me. Now I am a very private person, and also a very cautious person. I could tell this guy was trying something, and I acted dumb, even though I knew what was going on. My friend had noticed that after the last time he came over that this guy was staring at me any time he passed by. I could tell he was staring at me because of the windows that made a reflection, because my back was to him. It got a point where I told my friend we need to hurry because this is making me uncomfortable. So we finished quickly and left. Now my friend and I did originally go to the movie theater, but decided to watch the movie at home because of how busy it was. When we decided to watch the movie at my place, we tried to hurry and leave because of the time, and that guy was going to be getting off any minute. I don't think I will be going to buck any time soon because my hair color is blue. It's very noticeable, and not many people have that color in my town. 
Plus, it's a smallish town. I hope to never meet this guy again, and if I do, I may have to have a backbone, especially if he acts like he did this time. Not a very interesting story, and also trying to tell this days later doesn't help, but that's my creepy encounter. I've been getting sleep paralysis since a kid, but the past two years, especially the past few months, have been crazy. I don't sleep for for days sometimes. I'm so tired all the time because I can't sleep peacefully. I've tried melatonin, nightlights, even giving my room and house a cleanse. I've seen many things and voices when having sleep paralysis and also have had these things physically touch me aggressively. I wake up with fear, panic, and goosebumps all over my body every time. I'll list the things I've seen while having these episodes, if that's what they even are, baby on the edge of my bed. A man with an all-white tight suit, head to toe, including fitted mask with a red patch on his mask on the right side. A girl or woman with black hair who covers her face with it and wears a grungy tight gown or dress. She grabbed me by my wrist and left a bruise. A black figure hovering over me while seeing flashes of white light. Just two weeks ago, I was sleeping in bed, face down on my stomach. I don't sleep on my back, and I felt like someone got into bed with me, and I genuinely just thought it was my sister-in-law since we lived together. I remember looking over, and this woman was sitting next to me with black hair and white gown. She had her back towards me while she sat on my bed by my feet. That's when I felt I couldn't move. It felt like someone was on my back pinning me down while they held my wrist down to my bed. I started hearing this woman whispering in my right ear, but couldn't understand what she was saying. Then I was out of it, and again that feeling of panic or fear and goosebumps took over my whole body. It's to the point it's affecting my mental and physical health. I'd love to get help, but where do you get help for something like this? It's also to the point that it happens even when I just try to take a quick little nap. I can't rest and I feel myself getting more drained every day. I don't know if I'll get answers here, but it feels nice being able to talk about it to someone at least. I had been working at the Greywood National Park for 10 years. I loved my job and the serenity that the park offered. The sound of birds whispering and chirping about their day filled my head as I watched the sun rise over the mountains and turned the pink clouds into a brilliant orange. Also, I knew every inch of the park like the back of my hand. As a park ranger, I've seen and heard a lot of strange things over the years. Some of them are hard to explain, and others are downright spooky. But it's all part of the job, and I've learned to take it in stride. One of the strangest stories I've heard happened a few years ago. A group of hikers had gone missing in the woods, and we launched a massive search and rescue operation. We combed the forest for days, but we couldn't find any trace of them. It was like they had vanished into thin air. Then, a week later, one of the hikers stumbled out of the woods. He was disoriented and confused, and he kept muttering about how the forest had swallowed them up. We took him to the hospital, and he eventually recovered, but he never spoke about what had happened in the woods. Another odd occurrence happened when a group of campers reported seeing strange lights in the sky. They described them as bright orbs that seemed to move in a pattern. We investigated, but we couldn't find any evidence of a UFO or anything like that. But the campers were so convinced that they had seen something otherworldly that they refused to stay in the park any longer. However, there was one area that I always avoided. The whispering woods, a dense and dark part of the forest where people claimed to hear strange whispers at night. It was a patch of forest where the trees grew close together and tangled branches blocked out most of the light from the moon. The canopy was so thick that it housed a complete layer of epiphytes, plants, that grow in trees but never touch the ground. In some places, hanging vines stretched from tree to tree and gave a glimpse through the treetops like ropes holding an invisible net up high. I hated to think about what might be lurking in the dark there. 
Some said it was ghost whispering, while others said it was the restless spirits of trees that had been felled in a great storm many years ago. Whatever the case, I never went near it. One day I was on my routine patrol in the drizzly, foggy forest. The musty scent of old leaves and damp soil leaked into the air as I brushed past the nameless trees. A low droning grew louder, and I spotted a silhouette through the mist. It took me several moments to adjust my vision and make out that it was an elk. Suddenly I came across a group of terrified hikers. They were huddled together. Their faces were pale and their eyes wide with fear. They were trembling and clutching at each other, their bodies tense and braced as if expecting an attack. Their clothes were disheveled and streaked with dirt and sweat, and their breathing was shallow and rapid. They claimed that they had ventured into the whispering woods and had heard eerie voices, urging them to go deeper into the forest. The hikers had barely made it out, and their pale faces were enough for me to take their claims seriously. Officer, thank goodness you're here. We heard these strange voices in the woods, and we don't know what to do, he said, his voice quivering with fear. I nodded, trying to calm them down. Can you tell me more about the voices you heard? Another hiker, a woman with short curly hair, spoke up. They were like whispers, you know, but they were so clear, and they seemed to be coming from all around us. We couldn't understand what they were saying, but it was like they were urging us to go deeper into the woods. I frowned, taking mental notes. Did you see anything unusual in the forest? The hikers shook their heads in unison. No, nothing. But the trees seemed to be closing in on us, and we felt like we were being watched, said another hiker, a young man with a backpack. I scanned the area, looking for any signs of danger. All right, just follow the path and leave the woods for now, I said, and the group did so. As the sun began to set, I decided to investigate the woods and put an end to this mystery. I ventured into the forest with a flashlight and walkie, talkie in hand. The sun's light peeked through the canopy of trees, barely touching the ground and leaving everything in a deep shade. The shadows stretched out like tendrils, reaching into the distance. Mist loomed in the air, making the trees seem bigger and more imposing. The wind picked up, howling softly and rustling the leaves of the trees as if beckoning me forward. A strange stillness hung in the air as if something hidden waited in the shadows. In the distance I heard faint whispers barely audible on the wind. As I was getting deeper, the air became colder and I tried to ignore the chill that ran down my spine. Then I stopped in the middle of a small clearing and started to listen. The place was bathed in a deep and eerie darkness, the moonlight filtering in through the canopy of trees. The shadows of the trees stretched out like tendrils, reaching deep into the darkness. The mist loomed in the air, making the trees seem bigger and more imposing. The ground was damp and muddy, littered with pine needles and fallen branches. A hush crept through the night air interrupted only by the soft chirping of crickets and the occasional croak of a frog. The breeze rustled through the leaves of the surrounding trees, and an owl hooted in the distance. Then I started hearing them, but they did not come from the forest. They were in my head. They were low, almost inaudible, yet highly unsettling. It's as if a thousand tiny voices were speaking at once, but all at once. Every syllable was whispered in an otherworldly tongue, full of unknown sounds and unfamiliar syllables. It felt like a cacophony of unearthly sounds that reverberated through my mind. Then I could make out a sentence, go away. As I stood there, the ominous tone of the word sent an immediate shiver down my spine. It felt like someone or something was warning me of an impending danger and my mind quickly processed the potential risks of staying in the area any longer. Without a moment's hesitation, I turned on my heels and ran away, out from the forest. Adrenaline coursed through my veins, fueling my quick escape as every step felt like a matter of life or death. I could sense the presence of an unseen danger lurking in the shadows, and my heart raced with every passing moment. The dense underbrush and tangled branches seemed to conspire against me, but I pushed on, fighting my way through the obstacles in my path. My breathing became ragged, and my heart beat faster and louder as I ran for my life. Finally, I emerged from the forest. 
gasping for breath, and I realized that my whole body was trembling with fear. The warning had been too intense to ignore, and I was grateful that I had heeded it. I took a moment to collect myself and to calm my racing thoughts, trying to make sense of what had just happened in the depths of the foreboding forest. What the hell was it? I muttered to myself in the comforting safety of my car while driving home twenty miles away. When I returned home, no matter how hard I tried, the memory of the foreboding whispers still lingered in my mind. Those voices were enough to keep me awake late into the night. My thoughts filled with dread and confusion as to what had happened in the forest. I decided to research the area in an effort to uncover the source of the mysterious whispers. I scoured historic records and digital newspaper clippings, hoping to find some evidence of what could have been lurking in that forest. What I found were only reports of people hearing the whispers. Also, I did find news articles with evidence of disappearances and strange sightings, but I was not sure if they were relevant or not. The thing is, those reports were from different parts of the forest each year. I was looking for a pattern, but there was nothing that could explain what had caused those whispers. Although I didn't discover any conclusive explanation for the phenomenon I heard in the forest that night, I could say with certainty that there was something strange lurking beneath its surface. I did not understand it yet. The next day I was so scared that I called in sick to work. I needed a rest to put myself together and process the events of the previous night. I looked out of the window. The sky was a deep shade of gray, with heavy clouds that blotted out the sun and concealed any hint of blue in their shadows. Rain poured down in sheets, puddles forming in low-lying areas and overlawing into the streets. The world outside was blurry and distorted, an endless landscape of gray and mist. The rain tapped heavily outside like a symphony of drums, creating a mesmerizing rhythm. The windows were blurred with droplets, creating a static soundtrack from the raindrops hitting the glass. The wind whipped through the trees, and the thunder rumbled like waves crashing against the shore, and the lightning flashed briefly like an explosion of light. I reclined on my couch and listened to the raindrops, but a few minutes later, I turned on the television. Soon, a report about a forest came up as the news of the day. Huge rocks, trees, and debris were strewn across the land. The force of the landslide had upturned the entire terrain, leaving a mangled mess that stretched for miles. Heavy boulders have come crashing down from the mountain, and there is destruction everywhere. Huge cracks had formed in the ground, and deep ravines had been created as far as the eye could see. Pools of muddy water reflected the dull sky, and a thick haze hung in the air. Then I realized it was the forest where I had been working for years. The forest was completely destroyed by a landslide. Good morning. We begin this morning with a breaking news story. A massive landslide has struck Greywood National Park, causing extensive damage and destruction. The reporter said, People were walking around, carrying equipment and searching for survivors. The landslide occurred early this morning, and it has completely destroyed the park. There are no reported fatalities at this time, but many people are missing. The cause of the landslide is currently unknown, but officials say that recent heavy rainfall may have played a role. The park was a popular destination for hikers, nature enthusiasts, and tourists. It is estimated that millions of dollars in damage have been done to the park's infrastructure and facilities. This is a tragedy. The National Park Forest was a place of natural beauty, and now it's gone. I can't believe it, a local resident said to the reporter. Recovery efforts are underway, and emergency services are on the scene. However, the park is expected to remain closed for an indefinite period. Our thoughts are with those who have been affected by this disaster. The reporter finished his news report. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and my jaw hung open in disbelief. Suddenly, everything clicked into place. The whispers were not meant to cause harm. They had been trying to warn us all this time. The forest seemed to know its death was coming. It was close to three in the afternoon when the knock came on the door to the ranger station. 
I was mildly surprised to hear it, given that it was early January in the foothills of the Adirondacks. A temperature was hovering at a balmy 12 degrees, with wind chills driving it into the negatives with frustrating frequency. The wind had been howling against the isolated station since before sunrise that morning, and I wondered if I was going to need to deal with any damage to my little abode after the storm blew through. I'd been monitoring the forecast and weather radar all day, and it looked like I was in for quite the blizzard by the time evening rolled around. It had been snowing most of the day already, but so far it hadn't been very heavy. I expected that to change by nightfall, however, which in January was only in another couple hours. I didn't usually keep the front door to the ranger station locked, since it wasn't uncommon for hikers and campers to make a pit stop on their way up the trail to the observation areas, either to log their camping site for the night or just in hopes of a nice hot cup of coffee before they continued on their hike. The door hadn't been latching correctly lately, though, and had the tendency to swing open when a strong gust caught it just right, so I'd been keeping it locked until I could repair it. The knocking was light, somehow hesitant and almost polite, if that makes any sense. It was so quiet that I almost didn't hear it over the whistling of the wind and creaking of the station. I'd been in the middle of composing an email request for a new generator, as mine had been acting up a bit lately, and had to pause my typing and listen intently to ensure I'd even heard it in the first place. When it came again, only a bit louder, I pushed back from my desk and took another sip from my steaming mug before walking over and opening the door. Outside stood five people, three men and two women all dressed in what looked like expensive and very new cold-weather coats and snow pants, all looking very similar except for the various bright colors and all bearing the familiar North Face logo. Their anxious faces peeked out from within their drawn and cinched hoods, and I had to suppress a grin. They looked dressed to climb Everest, not hike the lower trails of the Adirondacks. Tourists probably European and probably their first time seeing this sort of weather, I thought. It was a fairly common occurrence. Folks from all over the world came to visit these mountains, looking to experience all the beautiful wilderness we had to offer. I wasn't unsympathetic. If you weren't used to the unpredictable climate here in the winter, it could quickly catch you by surprise and get dangerous very quickly. Hi there! I said cheerfully, stepping back into the doorway and motioning them inside. Come in out of the snow and warm up by the fire. The man had been knocking, turned to his companion, said something in Spanish, and then turned back to me with a wide grin and nodded, stepping past me and into the warmth of the station. The rest followed quickly, anxious to get out of the chill wind that was blowing hard outside. As soon as they were all in, I closed the door again and locked it to make sure it didn't blow open. Gracious, sir, I am Martin, said the man, pulling back his hood and unzipping his quilted down coat. He gestured to the others in turn. This is Lucas, Diego, Sophia, and Triana. I nodded my greeting to each. Martin continued with a smile. It is very cold. We come to visit United State of America from Spain to see your beautiful mountains and enjoy the lovely scenery. His accent was very heavy, but his English was far better than my Spanish, so I didn't have much room to criticize. But it seems a storm is coming, and we fear there will be too much snow. Unfortunately, we are not so prepared for that. I nodded, patting him on the shoulder as I moved past him and opened the door leading to the shelter room, reaching in and turning on the lights. That's certainly true, my friend. I'm afraid we're in for a bit of a blizzard this evening. Bad time for a winter stroll through the mountains, I said. Fortunately, we happen to have enough space for you and your friends to make yourself at home and wait out the storm. My name is Jackson Turner, Ranger. There's coffee over there on the table and bunks and a comfortable sitting area in here. When a group just stared at me blankly for a moment, I got the feeling I'd lost most of them somewhere along the way. Instead, I just offered the friendliest smile I had and gestured to the room. At that, 
They all grinned and nodded their thanks as they quickly shuffled past me, dropping their packs on various bunks and beginning to remove their cold weather gear. I made sure they all got something hot to drink and that they understood they were welcome to stay until the weather had cleared before returning to my desk. They all seemed very pleasant and grateful for my assistance, and they drifted from my thoughts as I continued my administrative work. It was another hour before the second knocking rapped at the door, this one slow and oddly arrhythmic, almost a staccato beat, somehow unsteady and not as tentative as my other guests had been. I sighed heavily and straightened, heading around the counter and back over to the door. I hadn't had any visitors to the ranger station in a week or more, and now they were pouring in like this was a holiday in express or something. I unlocked the door and pulled it open, putting on my official greeting smile once again. In the doorway, shoulders and hooded head covered in a layer of icy snow, was a man of roughly my height, about six foot or so. Unlike the others, he wasn't dressed in fancy, color-coordinated cold weather gear, but instead wore a mismatched combination of clothes, like he had raided the bargain bin at a second-hand expedition store. His pants were a blue quilted nylon and looked more on the expensive side, even if they didn't exactly fit him very well. But his coat was fur-lined and looked like it was made of padded wool, layered over an old fleece jacket. His boots looked newer and not too warm, something more suited to a summer hike than a winter in the mountains, I thought. Hey there, I said as warmly as I could, waving him inside. Come on in out of the snow. He didn't say anything, but gave the slightest hint of a nod as he walked past me. The strong scent of musky body odor followed him, and I wondered if he was one of those reclusive hermits that I'd heard rumors of, living out here all by himself in some makeshift shack. I closed the door and locked it again, turning back to the man. He'd already taken note of the bunk room to the left, where the Spaniards were getting settled, and he headed on and sat on one of the empty bunks in the back corner of the room. He didn't remove his coat or offer any greeting to the others, and I noted with some curiosity that he didn't have any sort of pack with him, which further made me wonder if he lived nearby in some off-grid cabin. I could see that the others were smiling and making pleasantries towards him, but he just sat there, dark eyes quietly watching the activity without a single word. There was the slightest hint of a smile upon his lips, incongruous, and somehow unnerving. It only took them a few moments to abandon their attempts at including him in conversation and turn back to their own group, speaking quietly in Spanish amongst themselves. For a moment I wondered if he might be in some sort of shock. The temperature was dropping pretty quickly outside, and it had already been too cold for some of the clothing he wore. I considered giving him a quick once, over to make sure he didn't have any frostbite or signs of hypothermia, but something about him told me he might not be so welcoming to my attention. I stood there in the doorway to the bunk room for a minute, looking over the scene. Something about the newcomer seemed off, somehow. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but the way he moved, his lack of communication, the way he was just sitting there perfectly still on the corner bunk just seemed strange. There was something else, too, something that I couldn't quite put my finger on, something that tickled the back of my consciousness, just out of reach, more an instinctive unease than coherent thought. I found myself hoping the man would spend a few minutes warming himself and then be on his way again. Turning my attention to the others, I realized that they must have found something odd with him as well. They had all subconsciously clustered around the end of the table farthest from him, and were speaking more quietly than before, more subdued. I noticed them periodically casting quick, uncomfortable glances in his direction, but never for more than the briefest of moments, as if they were just reassuring themselves that he hadn't moved and was still sitting there. I also noticed curiously that none of them sat with their back to the man, likely also subconsciously. I was just about to walk over and talk to him to shake the odd feeling away when Martin appeared in front of me, his brow furrowed. Sir, my friends and I are worried about the other campers, he said. This drew my attention. 
There weren't any campers registered to be out here today. Was the newcomer one of them? Maybe they were in trouble. What campers? I asked with a frown. He motioned vaguely to the north. We passed their campsite on our way to the observation point before the weather turned us back here, maybe a half kilometer up the trail in a clearing beside a small brook. He cast a quick look over his shoulder at the stranger sitting in the corner. There it was again, I thought, that same unease. Martin continued. There were three of them, two men and a woman. They had some of those cold weather tents set up and seemed to be well prepared for the storm, at least as far as we could tell. We stopped and warmed ourselves by their fire for a bit. They seemed very experienced and were not concerned about the cold, but I'm no expert. Well, it sounds like they should be okay, I said with the best reassuring smile I could muster. They should have checked in with me, but if they're as prepared as you think, I'm sure they'll be just fine. When a storm passes, I'll head up there and check on them, just to make sure. He flicked his eyes to the man again, and then locked them with mine with a surprising intensity, like he was trying to tell me something with his gaze alone. He lowered his voice and said, The campers, they were all wearing very good clothing. Sophia's brother is a climber in some very cold regions, and she recognized the camper's gear is similar to what he uses. Even better news, then, I started, but Martin cut me off. Exactly like the pants that man is wearing now, he said quietly. I looked over at the man again, once again taking note of his hodgepodge combination of clothing. The gloves he still wore looked to be thin and ill-suited to the winter weather but looked well, made, and would have been fine for a mild autumn outing. He still hadn't moved or said anything, and his emotionless eyes drifted slowly across the Spaniards with what seemed to my growing paranoia like a hungry interest. It was almost like he was inventorying them, evaluating them, somehow. Once again, that tickle in the back of my brain, telling me something was not quite right with a man. Something was just a little out of place, but I still couldn't figure it out. It set my teeth on edge. I looked back at Martin. Are you sure? He shrugged. As sure as we can be. Sophia says she is certain, but the rest of us do not have the experience to recognize these details. As well as her, was this man with them? I asked, but I already knew the answer. Martin shook his head. No, I have never seen him before now. He leaned in a little closer and lowered his voice. This man, there is something, he said, trailing off, unable to find the right words. I nodded. I know. I feel it, too. I walked back to my desk and opened a drawer, retrieving the holstered handgun and attaching it to my belt. The spare magazine went into my pocket, and I grabbed my heavy jacket from a nearby hook and pulled my fur-lined hat over my ears. Martin followed me, watching with interest. I looked over his shoulder, making sure we were out of sight in earshot of the bunk room. I'm going to check on the camp. Have you ever handled a shotgun? I asked. He nodded. I hunt pheasant with my cousins every year. I am a very good shot. Good, I said. That doorway beside my desk is my room. Right inside you'll find a 12-gauge pump, loaded but not chambered. If you need it, he just gave a silent duck of his head. I should be back within the hour. I know the place you're talking about. Keep him here until I return. But don't do anything if you don't have to, I said, closing my coat and making sure the zippered slit covering my holster was open and accessible. Be careful, Jackson Turner. I feel some darkness in the air. I just gave a tight-lipped nod before opening the door and stepping out into the wind. The icy chill hit me immediately, cutting through my heavy pants and finding its way through every little opening in my clothing. The wind out here was a constant buffeting and howled in my ears. The snow along the trail was only a little over ankle, deep but tugged at my boots with every step, slowing my progress. The area that Martin had described was one of the few marked campsites along this area of the trail, and though it wasn't strictly required for campers to check in before setting up, it was highly encouraged. This deep in the woods, twenty miles away from the nearest town, the only real lifeline that 
anyone had with the rangers. If anything went wrong out here, the fact that you registered with a local ranger station may very well mean the difference between life and death. That didn't mean that everyone followed that rule, though. Most of the time, it was new campers, those folks lacking some of the wisdom of experience, that didn't know or didn't think it necessary to check in before setting camp. Sometimes it was the opposite. Some highly experienced outdoors folks felt that there was no need, that they could handle anything that came their way. Either way, as I followed that northern trail, a growing unease began to color my steps. I felt the tight grip of anxiousness tickling my every breath. I didn't know what I was going to find. If I was lucky, I'd find three cold weather, double wall silicone, nylon tents, with their occupants snuggled warmly and safely within. If that was the case, I'd just check on them and turn back to my station, hopefully before the worst of the storm began in earnest. If not, well, I'd have to figure that out when it came. A half hour later, I reached the campsite, or at least what was left of it, the remains of what were obviously three high-quality winter tents were positioned compactly around a central fire pit, their bright red materials shredded and torn and flapping violently in the fierce wind, looking very much like a lunatic array of flags in the heart of a hurricane. I pulled the ears of my hat lower, adjusting the chin strap tighter. Hello, I shouted, straining to make my voice carry above the wind. Even with all my force, it still sounded pathetically impotent in the roar of the coming storm. Is anyone here? I waited a long moment, but could hear nothing but the rush of wind and the whip-like snapping of the nylon fabric. The campsite had all the hallmarks of a bear attack. Except I hadn't seen a bear in months, and we'd never had a bear attack in this area that I'd ever heard of. It wasn't like the forests out west. We didn't have brown bears here. Black bears, yeah, but they were smaller and nowhere near as aggressive as big browns. Sure, they could be dangerous, especially if startled or threatened, but they didn't actively hunt humans. I took a few more steps forward into the campsite, drawing the SIGZAR 10mm, and holding it at low, ready as I performed a quick visual of the tents. Nothing. No signs of bodies, blood, a struggle, anything at all. Just destroyed tents that could have been abandoned by the campers when the wind started getting bad and the fabric started to fail. And then it caught my eye, a flash of dark gray partially hidden by the snow between two of the tents. Another ten minutes of snowfall and I'd have never seen it. Moving closer, I towed the frozen bundle of cloth, overturning it before picking it up with my free hand, keeping the sag at the ready. It was a pair of thick winter pants, old and torn, and covered in dark red-brown stains that looked too fresh for my comfort. They were fur-lined and looked to be woolen. As soon as I lifted them free of the snow, the wind blew a familiar musky smell into my face, and I dropped them in revulsion. Another two feet beyond, the hint of blue and the white drift drew my attention, and I cautiously approached. I recognized the puffy material of a cold weather jacket, and when I reached out to expose more of it, I staggered backwards in shock, realizing suddenly that I was looking at a crudely dismembered arm, still wrapped snugly in its warm jacket sleeve. I cursed aloud and stumbled backwards, tripping over the stones surrounding the fire pit and falling hard on my ass. Eyes wide and not even registering the pain of my tailbone meeting the frozen ground. I sat there hyperventilating for what felt like minutes, long enough that the frigid chill was settling into my legs and backside from where I sat dumbly in the snow, eyes wide and breath ragged. It was only when my arms began to shake that I realized I was gripping the handgun as tightly as I could, aimed insanely at the gray mass of frozen trousers on the ground before me, as if they were going to suddenly spring to life and attack. Shit, was all I could think to say as rationality suddenly returned, clearing the pulsating red spots from my vision and slamming my thoughts back to the present jarringly. The pounding in my ears began to lessen replaced once again with the unrelenting wail of the wind. I leapt to my feet and started running back along the trail, 
back to my station, where Martin and Lucas and Diego and Sophia and the other girl, whose name I couldn't remember, sheltered from the coming storm with. With what? Was he some sort of psycho serial killer, stalking the lonely hiking trails of upstate New York? That didn't make any sense. I'd been here for three years and never heard of anything like this. As I ran clumsily through the snow, which was now halfway up my shin, I thought back to those gray pants, discarded in the campsite. They had been shredded, not just torn and ripped from age and wear. It had been something violent that caused the damage, and the blood stains seemed to lend credence to that theory. So whatever had happened, the stranger had decided to replace his damaged and stained pants with what? Those of his victims. And then I thought about how none of his clothes matched and how his boots and gloves weren't even suitable for winter weather. How long had this been going on? Twenty minutes later, the dim yellow lights from the windows of my station appeared suddenly from the nearly white-out conditions that had overtaken me with the full coming of the storm. The temperature had dropped even more, and I was amazed that I had been able to keep up my pace long enough to make it back, driven by adrenaline and fear. I slowed to a halt before my ranger station, noticing immediately how the front door hung open a few inches. My mind urged me forward to go racing in, but I had to take a few moments to catch my breath and let my racing heart slow a bit before I entered. I couldn't understand why the door was only open a few finger widths. If it hadn't been locked, the first strong gust of wind would have blown it fully open and sent it banging against the wood paneling of the wall behind it. But what occupied my thoughts far more was the implication of that open door. There's no way it could have been missed by anyone within, and nobody in their right mind would have sat in the station while the freezing wind and snow blew in through the open doorway. I pushed that though aside and crept as quietly as possible to the door, pushing it gently at first, then with greater force as I felt some resistance holding it closed. I gripped my sidearm tightly, muzzled directly forward and at chest level, finger resting along the frame of the pistol and ready to drop to the trigger and go to work in a moment's notice. The door gradually gave way and pushed inward far enough that I was able to slide through the gap, the howling of the wind and the protesting of the building blessedly providing enough cacophony to cover the sounds of my entrance. As soon as I stepped inside, I found myself in the center of a fever, nightmare, a body lay behind the door and had served as an impromptu barricade. I could only tell that it was one of the women by the delicate shape of the body. The lights in that room were flickering chaotically, the hanging bulb in the center of the room swinging maniacally, as if it had been recently struck and was still settling its pendulum motion. As quietly as I could, I ducked around the doorway into the room fresh shock coursing through my body in a cold wash that threatened my consciousness. Bodies and pieces of bodies lay strewn about the room haphazardly, most still enshrouded in bits of clothing, now tacked in place by a sticky crimson. I could feel the heat in the room from whatever horrifying act of violence had occurred, from the bodies that now lay scattered about like discarded plaything. At my feet, I noted a handful of empty shotgun shells where they had fallen and been arrested by the viscous gore that painted the wooden floorboards. The shotgun lay nearby a chamber open and magazine tube empty, only inches away from the barely recognizable remains of the man I'd known as Martin. Terrible slashes and wounds covered his ravaged corpse, looking as if he'd been thrown into a shredder. His limbs were outstretched and only attached by the yellowish tendons and pink muscles, which now lay open and exposed. My eyes were drawn at that moment to the source of the sounds I had heard before, and I saw the crouched form of the stranger straddling one of the bodies, Lucas, I think, by the bright yellow of his North Face jacket. I watched in horror as the stranger dipped his head again and again, jerking it savagely each time it came away, as if tearing away more bits of meat with each movement. I noticed then that the stranger's hands had somehow grown, elongated, and taken on a shiny, chitinous appearance that left the fingers as jagged and gore, encrusted claws. 
After only a moment's shocked hesitation, my reflexes took over, and I snapped the muzzle of my handgun up and squeezed the trigger. I know that the thunderous blasts of the tin mum must have been deafening, but I barely registered it as I watched blackened holes appear in the thing's back. It threw its head back in what I can only hope was pain and cried out in a shrieking screech that drowned out all else. I squeezed the trigger again, and another bullet punched its way through the horrifying thing. Suddenly, almost faster than I could track, the stranger exploded up from where it had been feasting and lit upon the wall, its terrible claws sinking into the wood and holding it in place as it turned its head 180 degrees to face me. The eyes had turned completely black and grown to the size of golf balls, and the jaw looked almost to have disjointed from its skull the skin at the corners of its mouth drawn back in a hideous grin that stretched nearly from ear to ear, exposing a mouth full of shark-like triangular teeth, now stained bright red. It tensed, and an instant later it had leapt to the next wall, gripping the exposed wood like some monstrous insect, eyes fixed upon me. Before it could make another move, I fired again and again and again. My panic-induced attack miraculously finding purchase more often than not as empty brass cases ejected against the door frame next to me, ringing out like death bells. Then there was a long moment of silent stillness in the room, and its black eyes were fixed on me, still unnervingly cold and alien. I tensed, waiting for the thing to pounce towards me. But it was clear I'd heard it. I don't know how badly, but black ichor dripped from the half-dozen wounds punched by my hollow points, and I thought I heard a sickly rattling in its slow, deep breath. With a final ear-splitting, otherworldly shriek, it leapt again, this time away from me and through the window at the rear of the room. The glass shattered outward, and then it was over. I stood alone in this charnel house, left only with the remains of the five Spanish tourists, and the disconcerting awareness that the slide of my handgun was locked back, smoke lazily drifting from the barrel, and the magazine now empty. That was almost a year ago, and I've since transferred from field operations to an administrative position within the park service. My office is located in the middle of a city, surrounded by people and without a lonely forest or dark wilderness in sight. After the investigation died down and the deaths were ruled as animal predation, I tried to return to my posting, but I just couldn't do it. They tore down the old station and built a new one closer to the trailhead, and I thought I could get past it, but I kept seeing that stranger, that creature, every time I closed my eyes. A few times in the dark stillness of the night, I thought I could hear that banshee wail echoing in the distance. Once or twice, I think I heard more than one. I slept with my handgun on the nightstand and the shotgun propped next to my bed and kept the doors locked at all times. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was still out there. Maybe searching for me. Maybe it needed to make sure that I wasn't able to tell anyone about it. You see, in the time since that horrible night, I've scoured the Internet for any possible explanation for what I saw. I consulted any self-proclaimed cryptozoologist or paranormal investigator that would speak to me, but nobody had any rational explanations beyond fairy tales and urban legends, and invariably I was left with as many questions as I started with. And then I tripped across an article one day that changed everything for me. It was a piece written about something called the Uncanny Valley, an idea put forth by some Japanese roboticist. Back in the 70s, at first I almost passed it over, since it seemed mostly to relate to robots and computer graphics, and how people feel increasingly uncomfortable the more realistically human they appear. But then I read a theory about why people may react this way, and how it may be an evolutionary artifact left over in the dark corners of our reptilian brains, about how, at some point in our distant shared racial history, there may have actually been predators that looked almost human. They may have appeared so close to our ancestors that they were able to blend in with us almost perfectly. According to the theory, primitive humans may have developed a keen sense of facial recognition as a survival mechanism. 
This may have been passed down through genetic memories, fading just a little with each generation until today, where it existed as little more than an instinctive warning when we looked at someone who wasn't quite right. Someone who seemed almost normal, but perhaps with the slightest of imperfections that made them seem just a little wrong. Someone that our instincts told us didn't belong. Someone who wasn't really one of us at all. I wondered if these things have been with us all along, hiding among us, stalking us from within our own numbers. Yesterday, on my commute to the office, I noticed a young woman sitting by herself in the back of the subway car. Even though it was crowded, the seats beside her were empty, and I noticed that the other commuters almost seemed to be avoiding getting too close to her. I don't think anyone really realized it, but people kept glancing uneasily at her out of the corners of their eyes. There was nothing overtly out of place with her, and it could have just been happenstance that nobody had elected to sit down next to her. I just couldn't shake the feeling, though, that something just fell off. Ever since I was a small child, I've always gone hunting with my father. We hunt on some property that my family owns back home in the southern part of South Carolina. We hunt mostly deer from tree stands. We have set up in various locations. A front stand nearest the road, a middle stand further back through the wooded area, and the back stand, which is the last stand with a giant cornfield in front of it. We will hunt every day if we can. When I'm off, Seraph's deputy, or my dad is off, owns a company. Well, every day, that is except for Sunday. My dad has always told me that we don't hunt on Sundays. It was a Christian tradition his family had of some sort, or so I thought. One weekend I found out I had a Sunday off and I wasn't on call. And I called Daddy up to go hunting. He was immovable on his stance to not hunt on Sunday. I remember saying something like, Oh, come on. I know it's a tradition, but it's my only weekend day off. That's when he told me the other terrifying reason he won't. As he tells the story, the first and last time he hunted on a Sunday, he went early morning before first light. We try to get to the stands about an hour or a half before the sun comes up, as to give time for things to settle down. He says that morning, everything was quiet, and the moon lit up the dirt road he walked down to get to the tree stand. He recalls it being an eerily silent. He had to step lightly so he wouldn't make too much noise. Well, he gets to the stand when it's still pitch black dark and waits. He will swear by this next part, as first light came, just as he was barely able to make out anything. He saw two does come running out of the corner of the field. They won't run like that unless they are spooked or something is after them. As he fixes his eyes on the corner, he sees what he describes as a black figure, running on two legs and dropped down to all fours, running after the deer. He says that his feet didn't hardly touch the ladder or the ground as he flew out of the stand and ran back to the truck. What he saw, I don't know. Whatever it was, it was huge and black. Now we have no bear in this area and hardly any natural predators, much less something that big. So I've always been weary of hunting on Sunday. That does not mean that I have not had my own encounter with whatever this thing was. One morning I wanted to hunt the back stand. It is known as a hot spot for the biggest bucks to come roaming through. My dad was out of town and my cousin was at home sleeping. I decided to suck it up and walk back to the stand in the pitch black darkness. Didn't hear too much because it was raining for most of my walk. Now, when you get to the back stand, you have to go through a think area of forest to reach the stand without walking through the field. The forest is lined with beer cans. You read that right? In order for us to make our way through there in the dark. Well, I began walking through the wooded area following the cans with a red-lighted headlamp on. I had gotten a quarter of the way to the stand before I heard it. Two large stomps, one right after the other, crunching on the beer cans behind me. So what did I do? I ran. I ran as quickly and as swiftly as I could. And when I reached the stand, I hurled myself up as fast as my legs could take me. I called my cousin and made him stay on the phone with me. I heard those steps around me all morning until the sun rose. 
Exhausted from fear, my cousin came and got me and took me back to my truck. I've never went without someone else hunting the property with me since. I did not get a good look. I think part of me didn't want to know. But it was heavy and crunched the beer cans almost flat. Any ideas what we could be seeing out there? Hi, so I've had a couple encounters that have left me feeling crazy and super off. I live in central New York, which is where each of these happened. So several months ago, I'd say probably around February or March, I was at a park with one of my friends after dark. We had gone there frequently, and nothing had ever seemed weird. My friend was standing off to the side of a shed a few hundred feet away from me. I was sitting in my car. I had been zoned out looking at stuff on my phone. He had been talking on the phone with someone. It wasn't until I heard this strange barking that didn't sound human or animal-like per se. I couldn't figure out which direction it was coming from. The sound seemed to be coming from every direction. I looked up and saw my friend quickly walking down the hill before coming to a dead stop, mid-step. When I looked around, I saw out of my side mirror something stand up from all fours from behind my car and sprint off way too quickly into the surrounding woods. My friend came running to my car, getting in and locking the doors before saying, Did you see that thing? It wasn't human. It looked like it, but it was way too tall and skinny. It had ran up behind your car and then went. It was going behind your car, it squatted down on all fours, and then got up and ran off. The second encounter. This happened a few months after, right around the start of spring. I was with three of my friends and one of their dads. We were in the middle of the woods at one of their campgrounds. They had gone off for a walk, probably twenty, thirty minutes ago. I had stayed back to watch the fire. Suddenly the world had gone almost silent. I almost felt like I wasn't even in our world anymore. It's hard to explain. I heard this woman screaming, No! No! Help! Someone help me! I had just sat there staring at the direction that I thought the noise was coming from, which was deeper in the woods. At first I thought maybe it was one of my friends yelling, but none of them sound like that. Something had also been off about this voice. After a few minutes it trailed off and got quieter as the world returned back to normal. My friends had returned after another fifteen, twenty minutes from a different direction than I heard the voice. So yeah, if anyone knows what these encounters are or has had similar experiences, let me know. Growing up, my house was very haunted. We had a lot of negative energy and weird paranormal stuff happened, but the most memorable event was the time I saw what I believed to be a ghost. Coming across this subreddit and delving more into crawlers, I have a feeling I might have seen one rather than a ghost, but I'd like input from other people. I've been searching for years for an explanation for what I saw, and I've never found anything as close as I have here. It's unsettling to see so many people sharing similar experiences, Low. When I was around ten years old, my friend came to stay with me while her parents were out of town. She was experiencing anxiety from being away from them and ended up crying herself to sleep. While she slept in my room, I watched TV with my mom on the couch. We both recall this in the exact same way. The lights were off in the living room with the TV providing the only light. We were both facing the TV when something caught our eye. We turned our heads, clearly seeing something run out of my room and across the living room, into the kitchen, and then disappear. It was pale and appeared to have a faint glow, but its skin was gray and sickly looking. It was bald except for random strands of wispy hair, and it was hunched over with its arms bent, running across the living room. It was super thin and you could clearly see its spine and ribcage. Its arms were skinny and bony. The only peculiar thing was it had horse-like legs, like goat, deer, or horse legs. I don't remember if it had hooves or feet, but its legs were definitely bent oddly. It was quick, but we tracked it all the way across the living room and into the kitchen. 
After realizing what we saw, and realizing we both saw the same thing, the only logical explanation I could think of was that I saw my friend run from my room. Of course, there was literally no way I saw what I thought I saw. I felt no fear. I was actually very confident as I got up and walked into the kitchen, but I quickly got scared when I realized my friend wasn't anywhere in the kitchen. I could see her across the hall, sleeping in my bed. I've discussed it with my mom multiple times, and we both recall it almost identically. I've never seen anything like it since then. I saw that they live in subterranean areas. It might be worth mentioning our house was on a sinkhole. I've also seen theories about them using portals, and I've always had a hunch that whatever I saw was moving between dimensions or portals, as it appeared from a hallway with no exterior doors and vanished around the kitchen corner. Last weekend, my five-year-old and I went tent camping in the Uintas northeast of Utah. The weather was overcast weather. By the time we got done paddleboarding, we made our way back to camp. Once we got back to camp, I couldn't shake this feeling of unease. I mostly shrugged it off, thinking I am overthinking the safety of my child. One thing to point out, there was a trailer and a truck close to us, but I never saw anyone throughout our experience from there. At around 8 p.m., we started our campfire. We roasted brats and ate snacks. During this time, I would think I heard a crack or subtle movement and thought it was just the embers popping. Once the sun finally set, I noticed it was completely pitch black outside the reach of our campfire, light most likely due to the overcast weather. At this point, I decided it's time to pack up our food and take it to the car. But I had this sudden feeling that I was being watched and I decided to turn my headlamp light on. I face 30 degrees to the right of me. About 40, 50 feet from us, I see a small bush-like tree. I want to explain this small bush-like tree was not thick or sturdy enough for something big to lean on or climb onto, and above the tree standing behind it, I see two big circle white eyes with a hint of purple staring straight at me. The animal or creature was far enough from the glow of fire I couldn't see a silhouette of a body, but it was close enough that it was odd behavior, and it was only seconds from us if it ran towards us. My first thought was it was a bear standing on its hind legs just being curious. It looked to be eight feet tall or so. As I had my light facing the creature, who was abnormally close to our campsite, I grabbed my kiddo in bear spray and told my kid there's a bear behind a tree and assured him we will be fine. This creature just watched us intently. Suddenly, a few seconds later, my intuition screamed, Get out now. I then started walking backwards towards my car and told my kid to walk slowly with me. The creature made no movement and tilted its eyes on us as we moved away until my light could no longer reach it. I can't explain this new type of fear I was experiencing. It was unnatural. I think prioritizing my boy's safety allowed me to get us to the car in a much more composed manner. Once in the car, we waited 30 minutes to see if it would come into the campsite to look for food, but nothing happened. I thought perhaps it left and we could sleep in the car to be safe. I decided that I am going to try and grab blankets from the tent, put out the fire, and we can pack out first thing in the morning. I thought wrong. The campsite from the car was about 150 feet away. To the right of us were big trees, and to the left of us is tall grass or brush. I get out of the door and turn my headlamp on. My light shines towards the brush, and laying low in the brush, I see the white eyes again staring up at me. I decided to try and act big and yell out at the creature, but it made a move towards me, which in return made me jump back into the car in reverse. I tried to shine my car lights towards it and couldn't see anything. I decided to find help. I'd drive down and find a friendly fellow dad camper who is happy to help me pack things up to leave. He arrives with a much brighter flashlight in his truck. As I am packing, he sees the eyes and mentions there's two of them. He states they're not moose, deer, cougars, and if it's a bear, it's really odd behavior. 
and he doesn't know exactly what they are. I face towards where he is shining his light, and I see a second pair of white eyes. At this point, I am terrified. One of them is standing tall, while the other is lower. This time, they are much further back, as if they now know there's a new reach limit to the light devices being used. It wasn't until the lower set of eyes decides to stand up and be much taller, then the first one looking monstrous. This made my new friend very uneasy, and he quotes, This has got me on edge. Let's just throw everything in your car and leave. The whole time we are packing out, I would catch these creatures creating a perimeter around us. They just walked around the campground in circles waiting for something, it seemed. I tried to think of rational possible theories, but the more I think about it, the more I can't shake the feeling this could have been a skinwalker or something else. They were too smart, intuitive, bold, scary, and didn't act like normal wildlife. Any thoughts on these creatures would mean the world to me. Thank you if you read this. I was getting goosebumps retelling the story. My story is scary, and I have been reluctant to mention it over the years. A few friends and family have been told, though I doubt that any of them believe me. The girlfriend who was with me at the time was deeply affected by the encounter, so much so that she has never really been the same since. In the summer of 2016, my then-girlfriend and I were camping in the Lewis Mountain Campground, which is near Skyline Drive in the Shenandoah National Park. We had been there several times before, and we always enjoyed our time there. I set up a large tent and separate canopy. There were no other campers within 100 yards, but we could hear others in our proximity. We spent most of the daytime hiking throughout the area. The second night, a Saturday, early Sunday morning, we were fast asleep. We had been out and about all day and were very tired. I believe it was approximately 1 a.m. when we were both awoken by a crashing sound outside the tent. I looked out the flap but couldn't see anything, so I got up with a lantern and walked to the canopy. I noticed that the camp stove had dipped over. I assumed it was the wind or that one of the legs gave way. I shrugged it off and went back to the tent. I hadn't gone back to sleep when I heard a strange chattering sound. It reminded me of the sound a monkey makes when agitated. Once again, I looked out the tent, and this time I noticed a tall shadow standing by the canopy. I woke my girlfriend and asked her to look. She was frightened, but eventually took a look. By this time, the shadow was moving slowly around the camp and making low, deep grunts. The first thing I thought was that a black bear was looking for a meal. But I then realized that this shadow was extremely tall and walking on two legs. I grabbed a flashlight and directed it towards the shadow. When I did, this shadow quickly materialized into a huge hairy beast that lunged towards us. We both bolted back into the tent and cowered against the far side. The grunts continued as this beast walked around the tent. I tried to call for help on my phone, but the signal cut out each time it connected. We were horrified by the ordeal which continued for about ten minutes. We were afraid to scream because we feared it would attack us. Eventually, the beast left the camp, but we stayed awake the rest of the night. We packed at daylight and quickly left. I later contacted the park authorities, but they dismissed my story. I'm sure that this beast was what people call a Bigfoot. My girlfriend and I soon broke off our relationship but she has had emotional issues since that encounter. I have bad dreams at times and have never camped since. Thanks for reading. I am a woman who goes hiking. I was on one of my regular trails and came to a fork in the road where I continue on my usual route. I'd never felt unsafe. A man around my age was there and asked if he could go the same way as me. I say yes. We talk and everything is fine until he randomly says he could overpower me at any time. Thankfully, we were near the mouth of the trail and he didn't attempt anything. I haven't gone alone since. My sisters and I were off. 
roading like two, three hours down a forestry road in British Columbia, Canada, before we found a good spot to camp. These roads weren't on any back roads map, so it was super remote, maybe 100, 120 from the nearest farm or sand on civilization. Middle of night, we were still up at the campfire when my sister said she saw a red light in the bushes that quickly disappeared. She was pretty freaked but we just laughed, thinking she was messing with us. Five minutes later, I spot the red light in the bush behind her. It's a video recorder light. I turned my headlamp on in the direction of the dim red light and see a man turn and run away with camera in hand. We freaked the F out, jumped into the truck, and drove down the narrow road without any of our camping stuff. We went back in the morning to collect. It was all still there, and we surveyed a bit farther to see if there was a sort of encampment or hunting lodge. Nothing, not even a walking path off the barely visible road. To this day, I wonder how long he followed us, or what his plans with these recorded videos were for. A lone human deep in the wilderness at night is hands down the most terrifying encounter. My wife and I were hiking in Sweden and three or four days into the woods out of the direction of population without seeing anybody else in days. In the middle of the night, we both woke up to the sound of footsteps, boots running even sprinting towards our tent as clear as day. So I shot up, went outside the tent, and there was nobody there. Even searched around the bed in the pitch dark of the forest, but we were alone. Not that big of an outdoorsman, but I, I loved to fish. I was out on a lake that was electric, only so I was using my electric motor. It was very early. The sun was just starting to come up. I saw what looked like a beaver or a raccoon swimming towards me. It was far off, maybe 100, 150 yards. So I thought nothing of it and went back to my fishing. Five, ten minutes go by and I decide to move spots. I looked back over, and now about twenty, thirty feet from me was that beaver that turned out to be a black bear. I let out a scream, and not a manly one. Threw on my trolling motor, which at full throttle moved me about as fast as the bear could swim. For what felt like an eternity, I was being chased by a bear in the water. It was probably only a few minutes, but it scared me enough that I keep bear spray on the boat at all times. Went biking with a buddy in a nature preserve at night when his chain broke about 15 miles from where we started. It's pitch black, except for our lighting, but nearly a full moon. We could see dozens of shapes slightly moving all around us about 20, 30 yards away as we were in sort of a clearing. That wasn't the freaky part, though. It was seeing the reflection of so many eyes staring at us from a distance that slowly crept towards Luckily, I carried spare quick change chain links. I had never fixed a chain so fast in my life before or since. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.